Okay, so this meeting will be recorded. <clears throat> I would just like to start by one, um, letting everybody know that we will not be endorsing anyone tonight, that our endorsements will all happen at the next meeting, which is February 15th. So hopefully, since there's a lot of um, unchallenged seats, we can do that in our regular two hours, but I'm gonna schedule it for three just to make sure. Um, so um, I just want everyone to be clear and we'll send the notice out for that, but we won't do any endorsements tonight. Um, okay, and we're gonna start right away. We have, um, we have uh, reports from the traffic committee and from the East River Park Committee. And then we're gonna go right into um, our listening to our candidates, if that is fine with everyone. So Tommy, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Just a quick up, update. I mean, folks know um, we lost our alienation lawsuit under what we think are questionable terms because the Court of Appeals first agreed to hear the case. And then mysteriously, the city went to work 24 hours a day for three straight days, destroying everything in the park before the court actually ruled. So we won't go over that. But <clears throat> We still have several goals, East River Park action, as the park goes forward. And they mainly involve uh, getting interim flood protection still, because there is no interim flood protection in the plan. And we've tried to get the studies that the city claimed they did, and we, they have withheld those studies for some mysterious reason again. So we're actually- Thanks, gonna, Debbie. We're actually gonna have to go to court yeah. to, get, to get that Good study. Job. Uh, again, um, we're, but we are very concerned now about things like air monitoring. For example, they told us it's supposed to have six air monitors in place during all the construction, and they only have two, and they have four more on order, and they haven't been able to tell us when those air monitors are going to come in place. Um, the other is soil testing, because they're dig digging up what is known toxic soil and they're not covering it, they're not watering it down, they're just leaving it open and exposed in the park. So we're concerned about that. Um, and some of the things we're looking to still mitigate as the plan goes forward is, for example, we're trying to get free ferry service from Corley's Hook to Governor's Island, which would at least provide people for an opportunity to get to some open space and doing it free would obviously be a big uh, big, important to a large segment of, of the community. Um, some of the other things going forward, and I see Michael Marino, we're also concerned about the future of Fort Lear's Hook Park because they announced that, um, you know, they're replacing the Fort Lear's Hook, Hook Bridge, and they haven't really told us how much tree removal is going to be necessary for that to happen. And the other is that as part of the parallel conveyance, which is part of the plan, they're also gonna be doing some tree removal and they haven't actually explained that. And the third thing is, there's gonna be a temporary bridge built from Coralia's Hook Park into the park around where the passive lawn is and the ferry in the interim while they work on replacing the uh, Coralia's Hook Park uh, bridge. So all those details are still uh, to come. And those of you who live near East River Housing, uh, starting January 24th, the Delancey Street Bridge will be taken down and it will be done including night work up till midnight. So there'll be work done for four weeks, they say, uh, up till midnight, taking down the Delancey Street Bridge. And Michael, I don't know if you wanna fill in anything else that you know, or I left out about Coraliers. I mean, I don't want to go over how much whatever time was allotted for this, but uh, we sent out something the other day. So those of you that are on our mailing list probably got it. If you're not on our mailing list, I'm going to forward it to people if you want to send me your email. But um, I don't know much more than what Tommy said. Uh, we've done a couple of walkthroughs with DDC, but those were two years ago. Um, they promised us another one as well at some point, but that has not been scheduled yet. Uh, but as far as we know, um, the tree removal plan that was in the appendix of the EIS 
shows about eight trees being removed from either side of the bridge. Um, we're talking about mature trees, the linden trees. Um, but what will most likely be removed from what we call Cherry Hill, which is the place where all of the kids sled, are all of the cherry trees as well. Um, those are not shown on the map because those aren't 60 foot tall trees. Um, but um, but we did in the in the message that we sent out and on our website, we have everything that we know, um, including a photo of the tree removal plan of the landscaping plan once the park is done and of the proposed site for the temporary bridge right now, which we were told at last week's park committee meeting is completely just a proposal at this point. It's not definitely that that's where the bridge is going, but they are still trying to figure out somewhere to put a bridge so that there is still ferry access for the Corlears Hook Ferry. And um, one other thing, sorry, the parallel conveyance project that Tommy mentioned is completely separate from the ESCR project. They are two separate projects. So the bridge that they're doing, the bridge work that they'll be doing starting in February uh, is probably gonna happen first and then the parallel conveyance will happen, we don't know yet. But as Tommy mentioned, we are gonna be losing trees uh, for the parallel conveyance work also. Um, predominantly the trees that line the FDR walkway uh, by the ball field, because that's where they are installing what they call a gatehouse, which will give them access to all of the infrastructure under the park to control the floodgates. So um, Tommy and Michael, is there, what are you asking, if anything, from the club to support you um, to protect as much as you can of Corlears Hook Park? Um, right now, it's just people keeping pressure on our elected officials and calling this to their attention. And by the way, the parallel conveyance, which is an important part of this project, because without it, we'll continue to flood. They just extended the fourth bid now to January 26th. Similar to what happened with the park, we don't know why, but the bids keep being pushed back. And if that doesn't get done, the whole park project is uh, worthless. But no, we don't have any specifics that people can do, but we're hoping that our elected officials will help us keep the pressure on, on the oversight. Okay, and keep us all updated, please. <clears throat> Daisy, I just saw a chat that you said that they've already approved free ferry to, to the park. Yes, I brought that up. Um, Michael, you remember when I first brought that up? And it was um, negotiated and it was approved, um, especially for the residents of NYCHA that get across, it's free. So I'll look for the email of confirmation and I'll provide it to you. And um, this way you can have it. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Kennel, my president from NDD was part of that um, negotiation and approval. So that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so please make sure to send it to me too. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll so send we'll it just send it to everybody. I can send it to you. You can um, send we'll it to everybody. It out. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. I know we could spend the whole night talking about this. We have a very full agenda tonight. So I'm going to ask Bill Ferns to give us a update on the um, traffic committee. And then we're going to go. I see that our assembly person is here and we're going to ask her to start. Uh, okay. So uh, the traffic working group, uh, we had 32 people who've signed on. Uh, 12 since the last uh, Grand Street Dems meeting. Our first Zoom meeting was on January 4th. Uh, we had about 25 plus people attend. I don't know exact numbers. I have two screenshots of all the people and they're not all the same. So uh, what we've had is a lot of members contributed to a, a sort of an overall goals document that we uh, put together for what we would be macro level uh, long-term proposals to fix the traffic area and the, the traffic problems and also uh, simpler low hanging fruit proposals, little tweaks that could still imp uh, improve things. Uh, the document got pretty full, but in the meantime, the 
Community Board 3 had uh, the Department of Transportation make a presentation to the, uh, the Community Board's Transportation Committee. Two of our colleagues are actually are members of that uh, committee. Uh, so the DOT made a presentation on its updates to the Clinton Grant Street study. Uh, I can actually, when I'm off, I'll provide a link that you can get downloaded. It's about 11 pages of a PowerPoint show. The uh, proposal is really small tweaks. Uh, it still basically assumes that Grant Street will remain uh, an on-ramp to the Williamsburg Bridge. They have no proposals to address that, to move the traffic any other places, uh, not, not to reinstate. Uh, you know, ways to get traffic from uh, north of Delancey uh, onto the Wiesberg Bridge instead of sending it through our neighborhood. So nothing. The centerpiece of that DOT plan is essentially they're going to make it that traffic coming down uh, Grand Street westbound, in, in other words, away from the FDR Drive, uh, will not be allowed to make a right-hand turn onto uh, Clinton Street. Instead, they will have to go down two more blocks and make a right-hand turn onto Grand, uh, Norfolk Street. Uh, you'll see it in the proposal. For some reason, they think this is going to make a big difference uh, because they say that uh, the Clinton Street traffic won't back up with you know both Grand Street and Clinton Street feeders. Uh, many of us are dubious because that just pushes the problem down to uh, Norfolk Street, where we also have uh, citizen senior citizen housing go up there, and they probably don't need all that traffic going by. Uh, so that's where the DOT is. Uh, the committee has been sort of discussing by email what's the best way to address of it. Uh, some of the Bolsheviks like me say we can try to get the CB3 to not endorse the plan, but calmer heads have convinced me maybe that uh, we should try to get uh, a lot of the, the DOT to con fix a lot of the vague, more vague details and a lot of details they really skimmed over. By the way, for those of you who know the intersection of East Broadway and Clinton, which is most of us, the report does nothing to address it. The report also does not address the concept of uh, traffic enforcement. Turns out the seven precinct doesn't really deal with traffic enforcement agents or TEAs. It's a transportation bureau. If you look at the transportation bureau on the NYPD website, they only give you a Twitter page to look at, no way to contact them. Uh, but uh, I've been able to speak to Caitlin Kelmar of uh, uh, Chris Marte's office, and also uh, thanks to uh, Carolyn uh, Lasco, uh, got to speak to uh, Representative Carolyn Maloney, and they both said they would help expedite getting both the NYPD and the DOT in the same room to talk about these problems. So that's what we're sort of working on. Great, thank, thank you. you, Bill, and you'll keep us updated as well. I'm going Go to I'm going to um, ask your all forgiveness. I, I didn't realize we we're going to have climate here tonight. So let's do a five minute climate um, update. Thanks, Sarah. Sure, I'll be brief. I don't want to step on our assembly members toes. No, um, as many you. of you know that um, we in Climate Sustainability Group represented by me and Laura and Mary Jo right now have been tackling uh, compost first because compost is a climate solution. When food scraps stay out of landfill, they don't decompose in a way that produces methane. So sending our food scraps to, to compost rather than landfill reduces our greenhouse gas on a very large scale. We've been trying to work with Department of Sanitation to return the brown bins to those buildings that had a pre-COVID and to, and to um, bring brown bins in um, to other, other buildings more broadly. We're kind of getting nowhere because it's an opt-in solution, an opt-in process. Melissa's gonna drop in the chat the form that residents and buildings have to fill out. If you're in this call, you think this is a good idea, please sign up because the more voices, the better. It's not binding, it's not spammy, it costs you nothing. It's just counting names in our neighborhood of people who are interested. Um, we, the climate group, had a constituent meeting with um, Chris Marte's office on his first full day on the job. We were his second constituent meeting. Um, he offered to work with sanitation to help us understand how many signups we need in the neighborhood, what the thresholder percentage is, because right now it's really unclear. We're like talking into a black hole when we try to contact sanitation. We just get um, 
reports saying not enough signups in your area. So we wanna know how many is enough and work within the neighborhood to get more signups. So um, if you, and there's some confusion whether it's individuals or buildings that need to sign up. So if anyone would like, we're trying to get a meeting um, between building management and sanitation to clarify this and to learn more. If anyone would like their building management to join this conversation, please let us know. Um, we're also keen to connect with NYCHA leadership to understand how composting might work in city owned buildings. Um, so that's that's the spiel. In the meantime, yeah. we have a list, uh, a link to food scrap drop off sites on the Lower East Side that Melissa is going to drop in the chat. Thank you, Melissa. One more climate action that is statewide, not neighborhood wide. You can get noisy with the governor's office. The group Food and Water Watch, a small organization that punches above, it, above its weight, organizes an automated weekly text prompt to call Governor Hochul's office with messages about opposing fossil fuel infrastructure and other related projects in the state. It's a different targeted message each week and it connects directly to her office. It takes two minutes, one, two minutes, super easy. I do it every week. I get a text prompt, piece of cake. Um, Melissa is dropping that into the chat as well. Call Hochul texts, there's the number and there's the website. Now I'm done and let's carry on, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I also want to say that I'm saving all these things in the chat. We can put together a blast for anybody who misses it. Uh, wow, you all did great at 716. So I would like to start our candidate, um, uh, our candidate presentations. Each candidate will get 15 minutes and we have given them the freedom to decide how much of that time they will use in presenting to us and how much they will use um, negotiating Q&A. Carolyn has agreed to be our timekeeper tonight, and she's going to clock 15 minutes and give people a one minute warning. And we're going to be pretty strict because otherwise we're going to be here till very late and then everyone's going to be mad at us. So we don't want that. So I want to start by saying that we are going to list. We've listened to two of our state Senate candidates. And since that time, we have a new candidate that has um, come forward to us, and that's our current assembly person, Yulene New. So Yulene, you're on. Hi. Hi, nice. <laughs> Hi from Albany. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I just uh, first I wanted to say thank you for the Grand Street Dems to host us and all the other club members that I'm seeing from different folks uh, from different clubs today um, and to take time to meet with me and give me a, a, a time to talk with everyone. Um, I really appreciate all of the people who are here because I know that everyone's really busy and you know we are going through a lot of difficult times with the new surge um, I've gotten a lot of calls about that um, I am currently um, you know I, I just want to say that in the uh, couple of last couple of days in this last week where things have gotten very cold um, I have been working a lot with um, NYCHA trying to get a lot of the heat and hot water issues solved for our district and it's been really really difficult and so there's a couple of other outstanding issues even though some of the buildings are now getting some heat and hot water so I am still on call um, so if I do get a call or if I do get a text I I'm so sorry that it will probably take up some of my um, time I'm away from all of you, but it would be an emergency. So I would not want to, um, I don't want it to interfere, but uh, it is for me a priority. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, we know that this pandemic and this crisis has really shown that our communities are very interconnected, that, you know, our healthcare um, affects one another and that we have to care about one another or else we're going to be, you know, um, hurting only ourselves, right? Because my healthcare um, is dependent on your healthcare and your healthcare is dependent on my healthcare. And, you know, all of our neighbors, um, you know, we have to keep each other healthy. And during this time, our federal government, our state government, our city government didn't help us the way that they should have. And it's really been our neighbors that have been the ones who have been uh, fighting for us. And I want to recognize all the folks on this call right now that have been, um, you know, fighting so hard to make sure that we're creating mutual aid and we're organizing, we're opening our, um, 
you know, small businesses or, or helping with what we can, um, you know, taking care of each other's kids, um, providing meals, testing, vaccine resources, um, making sure that we have bodies on the ground. Um, so, you know, I wanted to say thank you, but I also wanted to recognize that, you know, even with all of this work and even with all of us like trying our hardest, we're still, you know, seeing that there's another surge that we are still falling even farther behind that this is a moment that we really need pivotal leadership and pivotal decision making and we can do better and we must do better and i'm hoping that everybody wants to um wants to make that change with me uh, i think that we right now have um an opportunity an opportunity to make that pivotal change. And we need to have somebody who's always been advocating and listening to us um, and that will work you know, very swiftly to try to deliver pandemic recovery for everyone. We also need to continue to exercise our power um, to be able to make sure that we have more than just a legislator, but an advocate. And I don't want to take up a ton of your time today because I want to make sure that we have questions um, answered and I care more about listening to all of you than just to hear myself talk. Um, all of you know me, all of you know how hard I've worked. Um, all of you know that, you know, I will, always stand on the side of making sure that our community has the transparency and the access that it deserves and making sure that our government is not holding up um, certain things to uh, that could help us and also not um, rushing into things that will hurt us. And I think that it's really important that we are um, you know, represented well and uh, able to get the kinds of services that we deserve. You know, I think that I've delivered on so many different things that comes from, you know, when it comes to education, when it comes to, you know, our resources for our social service organizations, when it comes to making sure that our NORCs are funded, right? We all live in, in the Lower East Side, it's like three different NORCs, right? So I think that it's really important that we are uh, making sure that we have um, the supplies, the the social benefits, the resources, and the communication and the access that we deserve. With so many folks every single day, um, you know, asking our office for help, you know, we have seen what's needed to be done. We've done, um, you know, I think the best when it comes to constituent services. And I think that really, it's really important to continue that and to make sure that we have that kind of help for our community. And so I wanna make sure that we have um, a lot of time to have those questions. So I don't want Carolyn <laughs> to have to um, monitor too much of my time. So I'm just gonna open it up for questions and I'm happy to help here with whatever else that you need. Okay, so please, everyone knows how to raise your hands. Please raise your hand on the reactions. And I am going to take advantage of my being the host to ask a question. And um, so, Yulene, I'm my question really has to do with you have been a very active and as you said, done a lot of things as our assembly person. So why are you running for state senate? Why do you, how do you think that will be better suited to you? And how do you think it will help us more? Yeah, so I think that, you know, first and foremost, um, the Senate and Assembly are very um, similar, but also very different houses, right? And I think that it's really important to recognize that, you know, I think that um, we have, uh, you know, a lot of things that we need now. Um, and, you know, when I first ran um, as a public accountability and anti-corruption candidate to replace Sheldon Silver in the 65th district, a lot of people told me now isn't the time, right? That I was being disruptive, that the system rewards people who play the game. But I let them know and I let everybody here know that um, you know, the voters in my district know that I was not playing anyone's game. And I carved out a place for our voice in the legislature. And I found that community leaders and nonprofits and folks who had never voted before trusted in me to get the job done and we won. Um, I think that it's really important It's a, to take advantage of this, again, this pivotal moment uh, for us uh, and to make a statement and turn tides in how we govern. Being a Senator, you automatically get to be a chair of a committee and it gives you the power to make fundamental transformative change in our policy making process. I think it's really key that we have somebody who's willing to take that power and actually make the change. And I think that, you know, I am the person to do that. And I think that, you know, you have seen already that I have 
been willing to take the amount of power that I've had in the assembly to continue to advocate for our communities and that I have always tried to fight for the change um, that we want to see, right? And I did not shy away from tough votes. I did not shy away from um, making it so that our communities always had a voice at the table. And I did not shy away from when, you know, things got really, really tough when it came to, um, you know, speaking out against the governor when it, when it came to speaking um, up for our communities and fighting to make sure that we didn't have these emergency powers um, to fight for uh, you know our tenants and making sure that we had the first dollars for our public housing coming from our state you know as you know as things have continued to go on I don't think that there's ever been a day when you know I haven't fought for our community and I think that it's really important that we um, you know, that we have a fighter, right? An advocate, like somebody who's willing to listen and who's willing to fight. And I think that, you know, having the power isn't the, isn't the thing, right? It's about making sure that you're utilizing it to, to, to bring your community to the table. And I think that that's the most important thing. Thank you. We have some hands. Keen Berger. You're muted. Okay. There you go. So hi, so hi. glad. To hi, hi. Um, but, you know, I care about the whole world. I'm worried about the nation. And I'm also worried about New York State. And you talk about community, community, community. Well, a senator is supposed to care about more than the community. And I wonder, it seems to me that the way the New York State Senate works is it tries to work on the whole state at least in order to get things better for the country. So I worry about it. Why, why just focus on the community? I mean, I think I focus on everyone. I think that I really do focus on the state, right, as well, because we have to make the state decisions, right? But I think that the thing that drives every single piece of my legislation are the things that happen here. I mean, we are part of our state, and we're part of our city, and we're part of the nation. And I think that, you know, we have, um, you know, a lot of needs in our area, and I, I represent a district within the legislature, right? And I think that that's part of uplifting the voice to the legislature to make sure that as we are making a, a, a body's decision, that we are actually making sure that we are actually talking about the issues that affect us too. We are all apart, right? And just like we were talking about earlier, we're interconnected. Like all of the things that affect our city, our district is also affects the rest of the state as well. And so I think that it's really important that we have um, our section, our voice and our issues at the table while we are always discussing about how to change things better for our state and for the nation. Thank you. Harriet. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Harriet. Yeah, I figured it out. Thank you, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Eileen. Hi. Um, I do want to thank you for everything you've done to this point. Thank you. Um, but you know me. I always have something on my mind that bothers me, and I have no problem addressing that um, vocally. So speaking of everything, you know, community, 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 Besides the traffic, putting that aside, and I have mentioned this in the past, I cannot deal with the electric bicycles, the motorcycles that are on the sidewalk. I know that part of that, the problem is that there's no enforcement that, they're, that they should not be on there. But even the bicycles, the bicyclists neglecting to follow the, um, the red light signals, there's, there's, no, there's no regulation, there's constant violation. And it's really gotten to the point where I, I'm getting whiplash trying to either cross the street or just walk down the sidewalk. So I am more than willing to sit and talk to you about ideas that I have, but do you feel that that is a something of a priority because there's going to be a tragedy. And in order to avert a tragedy, can there be some kind of policy that you can think of that can be done or some way to enforce whatever policies we have now, which I, I don't see any right now. So can you oh. talk to that? 
Sure, I can, but I also want to note that um, when it comes to uh, City Department of Transportation, unfortunately, I am the state level representative, and so I can advocate, I can talk to, like, you know, whenever you've called me, I've called the city on your behalf, I've talked to folks um, about certain issues, and I've tried to make sure that we've had a conversation. This is the same thing when we had our walkthroughs and things like that with the Grand Street Dems, like, you know, we've um, you know, show DOT, you know, we walk through DOT, we can make sure that DOT comes to the district and talks to folks about certain issues. And we can make sure that we have some kinds of solutions that, um, that the community wants and then to uplift them. But I think that really, it's really important for us to, um, you know, differentiate between what city level and state level as well. But I will continue to always be your advocate when it comes to, you know, particular cases or particular things that you're talking about. You know, one of the things that um, we do have to, uh, you know, Know, recognize is that you know things obviously have changed a lot during this pandemic and we do um, have a lot of different things happening on the streets and so there are some state level things that we can do on that end right so for example when it comes to outdoor dining when it comes to um, some of the ways that um, certain things are built on the streets and then whether or not you know DOT or SLA has certain say over certain things like so there are all of these different things that we are working on currently um, and we have been in discussions about what is a reasonable thing to do on the state level and so you know we are I'm always listening to see what the community uh, is talking about and what we want as like a whole and like what are some of the things that will help to navigate some of these barriers and some of the things that are very difficult for, um, you know, accessibility, um, you know, I, I myself have a disability, so I know like what it's like to have to, you know, navigate a street with uh, a certain disability, right? And I think that it's really important that we actually talk about those things and, you know, make it so that, you know, we have accessibility of our roads, we have um, safety for every single person who's walking on the street. And, um, you know, that, you know, I, I personally felt like there was a uh, very different, uh, there was a very different, um, reaction for our mayor, for example, when he was talking about electric city bikes, but then not you know, allowing certain delivery workers to have their city bikes and they were getting fined. So there was a lot of differentiation with the way that their the policy was working. But again, that was on the city level. So um, we could advocate for it, but um, it was. Uh, I, 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 I one know minute you're, left, you're... one minute left. Just want to let everyone know. That's so we right. can try to squeeze in one more quick question and response. Oh, uh, Harry, if it's OK, okay I'm going to move on. Wanna... OK. Kim, would you like to ask your question? Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. Yulene, I appreciate so much of what you've done, but I do have a critical question. You okay. mentioned uh, transparency and pivotal action several times, and I feel where you've been lacking in, in taking action on both those things it would, is with the ESCR. And while I think we all appreciated that you came out, you know, with the strong statement kind of after the park was destroyed, you didn't do it before the park was destroyed. And I just want to know what, why, why didn't you take pivotal action to bring transparency to the ESCR, you know, before this went down? Oh yeah. Sorry. No, that's good. Why don't you answer okay. Kim's question? Sure. I mean, I, I think that I was very vocal. Um, first and foremost, again, this is a city decision. I personally was in all of the meetings that had to do with um, making sure, like I, I've advocated from day one that we needed to exercise our state's rights. Um, our state has a right to have a Park Saline Nation vote. Um, I was the person who, you know, brought it up within the meeting. Um, it became a uh, issue for me, and I was very vocal about it. I made statements about it. I, I'm not really sure where I wasn't vocal about it or standing up to make sure that we had that right. Um, I am a firm believer of complete transparency and inclusion in the decision making process that affects any of our constituents. And so we've seen, um, obviously, in the Lower East Side, especially what has happened when our government fails to think proactively about protecting New Yorkers during Superstorm Sandy. Our government failed those uh, that were living directly in the path of the storm. Um, even after that disaster, the city continue to ignore the voices of our residents. Sorry and, guys, that's um, time. That's okay. time. So Thank am I not you. supposed to answer the okay. rest of that? No, I think we're gonna leave it like that. Can I yeah. can I suggest, Kim, that you reach out to Eulene and get the rest of the answer um, in, you know, in more fullness. We really have a very full house tonight and I want to be respectful to everyone. Thank Bill, you. I'm gonna ask you to lower your hand and keep your question or reach out to Eulene and get your answer directly. Thank you, Assembly person, very much okay. for being here sure. and for starting tonight off.
Absolutely. Always welcome. Always welcome to ask me any questions that you have. And, you know, you know how to reach me. Everybody does. So. Great. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. OK, now we have four candidates for assembly for assembly um, replacing you lean on the assembly district 65. Um, and we're going to start with we have Grace Lee, Iapa, Syra Tupac, Jasmine Sanchez and Justine Cochia. And we're going to start with Grace. Grace, you'll have 15 minutes. Um, so I give a what if I give a three minute? I warning? think yes. It's thank you. I was right, going to so suggest that. We can squeeze in a full yes. Quick. Okay. Question so okay, so that's what I'll do. Carolyn is the timekeeper. She'll she'll tell you when there's three minutes left. You choose how much of the time you want to present and how much you want to leave for Q and A. Um, and I'm, I apologize ahead of time if I cut people off, but we're going to try to keep this rolling as best we can. So Grace, you're on. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Grace Lee. I'm a community organizer, a small business owner, and a mom to three young girls. And I'm also a proud resident of Lower Manhattan for the last 15 years. Uh, I, I'm just going to do an a introduction about who I am and would love to you know, leave time for, for a question so, um, and tell you why I'm running. So I'm running for State Assembly because I want to help make government work to improve the lives of the people of this district. And I have a track record for successfully mobilizing and organizing around issues in our community. And I wanna take that work to Albany. Some of you may know me through my work that I've done at uh, safe for a safe cleanup of a toxic mercury brownfield by my daughter's school in the South Street Seaport, the site of the largest thermometer factory in the country in the 19th century. And through that organizing and leadership with my Children First co-founders, we've fundamentally changed the trajectory of that project. State officials have said that they've never seen this much engagement in the history of the Brownfield cleanup program. We've engaged agencies from the DEC to the DOT and to the DOH. And by holding rallies, press conferences, and organizing community stakeholders to testify, we slowed down the process, won funding for an independent community monitor, demanded transparent data from the developers, and secured the formation of a task force. The fight of 250 at 250 Water Street might look hyper local, but when you step back, you realize that people in every neighborhood in the 65th district are fighting a similar battle. We all want the right to breathe clean air. We all want the right to a quality education for our children in a safe school. And we all want the right to stay in our homes without the fear of displacement by luxury development. Our communities right now need a proven leader who can attack complex problems, a leader who can bring all the stakeholders to the table to make sure everyone's voice is heard, and a leader who will not give up until problems are solved. I've learned a lot since my last campaign for the seat. I've become more familiar with the challenges our communities are facing on the ground, from Chinatown to Battery Park, from the Lower East Side to the Financial District. I've continued to gain experience and grow my skills to better serve the people of this district. The work doesn't stop just because you lose an election. I lost, but I didn't leave. In addition to the organizing I do at 250 Water Street, I have spent the last two years organizing deaf tenants who are living in deplorable living conditions on Forsyth Street. I became connected to them because my friend's mother lives there and asked for my help. Working with Bob Angles of the Broom Street Tenants Alliance, we have organized and empowered the tenants to stand up to their buildings management, held press conferences and got them on the evening news, and eventually created enough pressure to get the buildings management to make repairs. I also helped them sign up for vaccine appointments and accompany them to get their shots and help them apply for the emergency rental assistance program because there were no adequate accommodations for them to be able to navigate the process by themselves. And this is absolutely unacceptable. I'm very proud of this work to demand housing justice for these tenants and the work I've done to support my fellow organizers in this community, from fighting the Chinatown jail, to providing support to East River Park activists, to partnering with Vision Urbana to donate and deliver food for families and seniors in NYCHA throughout the pandemic. And through this work, I learned firsthand how the most mar marginalized and vulnerable people in our community are not receiving the resources they need, even when they are available. I've learned that government processes are not transparent, and I've learned that it takes broad coalition building to be able to affect change. So as the assembly member, 
I'm going to do things differently. My goal is to deliver tangible results to improve the quality of life for the people of this district. And I will do that by focusing on constituency services because not a single thing we do in Albany matters if it's not helping the people it's intended to help and protect. I will have a storefront transit accessible office that is staffed by people who reflect the diversity of this district. I will be a proactive listener and will hold regular task force meetings for different neighborhoods and the problems they face. I will champion progressive legislation that helps our community, like the New York Health Act and Good Cause Eviction, and I will also legislate from the ground up around the issues that matter to the people of this district. I will fight to fully fund NYCHA. I will fight to ensure our small businesses not only survive but thrive, and I will fight to bring funding to our community for climate resiliency and other infrastructure improvements. I'm honored to have the support of community leaders in every neighborhood. My proudest endorsements are from these leaders who've worked alongside me throughout the years and have seen what I'm able to accomplish. I look forward to working with them and our newly elected city council member, Christopher Marte. Between Chris and I, you will see collaboration between the city and state that this district has never seen before. And I look forward to working in partnership with all of you and the Grand Street Democrats to solve the challenges facing this district one block at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Very nice. Oh, Marion, you're on mute. Sorry. Did you, did you hear anything? Well, anyway, thank, thank you. you for your presentation. <laughs> yeah. And I want to, there's some hands raised already. I want to, and thanks, Melissa, for reminding me of this. Please keep your questions succinct so we can spend time hearing the answers to the question. Kim, is your hand up again or is it still up from earlier? No. Okay. Kenny Wind, I think you're the first one. Yeah. Uh, hi, Grace. I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, your work on 250 uh, Water Street. How does that affect issues on the Lower East Side uh, more locally here? Yeah, thanks, Kenny. That was um, that's a great question. I'm actually toggling right now between the CB3 Land Use Committee meeting and um, this Grand Street Dems meeting right now. I've got my phone next to me as well. Um, they are also facing a brownfield cleanup actually through the city uh, OER. And um, I'm helping, I'm trying to help to advocate on behalf of, uh, of, of residents at Two Bridges who are dealing with um, a similar cleanup issue. Um, when we think about envir environmental justice issues, these are also racial justice issues. And I recognize that there was a lot of privilege that I've had as a, a group of moms in the financial district and the seaport being able to work to um, defend our children's right to go to school safely and, um, and to protect their health. And I don't think that that's happening at every, all across this district. Um, you know, one of the things that I really am focused on is also passing laws to help protect um, communities from brownfields like that so that they have the ability to, you know, advocate on their behalf through funding for independent community monitors and that sort of thing. Um, I think this is the, the work that I'm doing at 250 Water Street is also very relevant um, with what's going on at East River Park. And I was on the community board meeting this past week uh, where they were talking about their air monitors and how they only had two and now they're going to get six and you know you know asking about where where are the hot zones how is the how how is the community going to be notified around around areas where you know they believe that there are a lot of toxins in the soil so you can expect me to be a very active advocate for this uh for this uh community on all issues um around envir uh, my environmental safety going forward Great, thank you so much, Chris. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm going to again encourage people to raise their hands and I'm going to um, ask a question if I might. And Grace, you kind of skirted around this, um, but how are you seeing, how exactly are you seeing racism and injustice play out in our community in this district? And what things will you do to dismantle it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I mean, it's very top of mind for me right now as an Asian American living um, in New York City right now. And, you know, just the kind of what happened, the terrible incident that happened on the subway 
Um, I've actually been the uh, victim of a, kind of a, an attack by a homeless person with my daughter um, in the middle of the day, close to a subway station. So some of this hits uh, really close to home. But every single thing that we do um, through the state needs to be done through the lens of racial justice. And I'm not just talking about the legislation, but I'm also talking about implementation. And one thing, um, you know, I, I like to talk about a conversation I had two weeks ago with my friend up in Harlem, whose uh, family is a legacy small business owner, and they're looking to get one of the, you know, few licenses that are going to go out um, in the, with uh, the legalization of marijuana. And, um, you know, so he's talking about the license and they're really excited about this opportunity. And I'm asking him questions like, what type of funding is going to be provided to black businesses when they are when they receive these license when they receive these licenses because it's not enough for the state to just deliver a um, you know deliver a license without support for these for communities like this and I think that that's these are really important questions that our state legislators need to be thinking about it's not just about the law and who gets a license but how these things get implemented. Um, in addition, I think we need to be thinking a lot about education. We know that communities of color were disproportionately affected, uh, especially during remote learning. And so ensuring that our communities have uh, the resources they need uh, during this time uh, for, from, the school, from a school standpoint. I remember during uh, the lockdown, having conversations with NYCHA residents who were saying they didn't have internet, and so their, their children couldn't learn online. And so, um, you know, we need to be making sure, you know, there are programs now to help fund uh, Wi-Fi in, uh, for communities of color, low income, um, for low income residents, and actually making the connection between these programs and the people who need them is what needs to happen. So um, I, I really think about this, um, yeah. not only at an ideological theoretical level, but in an implementation standpoint. And the only way to really do that is by doing the things like I talked about, the constituency services. Great, thank you, Grace. I, we have some other hands, Bill Ferns and then Harriet Skidelsky. You're muted, Bill. I, I, yes, I, 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 I just okay. wanna say we are almost at three minutes. Okay, so again- Okay, I'll be, I'll be quick. So okay. Grace, some of us are, are involved, uh, there's a, a involved with an issue that uh, a lot of home care workers in the neighborhood uh, who work for agencies in the neighborhood are required to work double 12 hour shifts and they yeah. don't get paid for the full amount because it's not a law, but a state regulation uh, <clears throat> about, about forcing them. Now I know there's a, a bill um, in, this, in the assembly, but it's not moving along very quickly. How do you, what's your position on, on this uh, bill? So yeah, there, as I understand, there are two bills. One is um, sponsored by Harvey Epstein, and there's another one that's sponsored by Eileen. Um, one of them is the split shift bill, so making it, um, you know, uh, making it illegal for um, home care workers to work 24 hour shifts. Um, and the other, um, I'm escaping exactly the, the intent of it, but also to ensure like wage, uh, proper wage uh, fairness. Uh, for for workers, and I support both of those absolutely. Um, I I actually my grandmother had Alzheimer's, and um, my family took care of her for many years in the home before we put her in the nursing home. So I know what it's I I know the type of senior care that these home care workers are providing to families. Um, that is not you know the law requires that they are able to sleep five consecutive hours and eight hours full in full. That's not happening when you're taking care of, of seniors with dementia. It's, it's simply not, you know? And so these workers have not been treated fairly. They have not been treated fairly by the state. They have not been treated fairly by, um, by, the, um, by their agency, CBC and others. And we need to make sure that these, that is corrected. Thank you. Great, thanks. We have time for one more, Carolyn. Harriet. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Grace. I appreciate you reaching out to us. Um, I have a very quick question. For all the people that really have trouble 
engaging on the computer. Mm. Is there any way that you would be willing to hold some kind of very small town hall meetings to, to address issues in person? I, and there's got to be some kind of way. I know, you know, the pandemic and COVID and everybody is doing everything online, but people are still going out to eat at restaurants. And, you know, is there any way, there are a lot of people that just don't have access to mm -hmm. getting online and to being able to speak to you directly and for you to address their issues in person. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Harriet, for that question. Um, I, 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 I feel this, I actually feel this problem very acutely with the work that I've been doing with the deaf tenants on the Lower East Side. When we talk about low tech, these, these are those residents. Very few of them are using computers. Uh, they also, I don't know sign language, so it's been, it's been quite interesting for me to even be organizing them. It's been a very physical organizing tactic that we've had to use, which is like knocking on doors and making sure people are aware, lots of flyers and that sort of thing. So um, I'm very familiar with that type of organizing and communication style and very dedicated to making sure that everyone in our district has access to my office. Um, so the ways that I would think about doing that with a lower tech community That's one is minute, again, so please wrap, oh, uh, wrap up. Yeah. Okay. Um, the lower tech community is, is doing a lot of the physical work. So you have to knock on doors. You have to meet people where they are. I can't tell you how frustrated I am that I have not been able to get a van for vaccines to this, um, this, co you know, this community. I've had to take them myself. Um, you know, in an Uber to take them to vaccine appointments. So, you know, I'm really like, that's that's something I'm very dedicated to doing. Um, I will do a lot of marketing around my district office as well. So people know about it. I will try to put it in a place that's very accessible so people can come and, and visit me there as well. So I will do all of those things and would love your thoughts on that as well once I get into office. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so Thank you. much, Grace. Thank you for coming to be with us tonight. Um, I see, is there one more? Oh, no, that's just Harriet's. Okay, so I, I think okay. I saw Iyapa come in. Our next candidate for the Assembly okay. District is Thank Iyapa. you, everyone. Bye, Grace. Thank you. Is Iyapa Syra Tupac? Yes, I'm here. He Thank is you. the Hi. candidate um, that, was, that was supported by the DSA, and um, we're happy to have you here tonight. So Ayapi, you understand you have 15 minutes and you can split that up however you want between presentation and question and answers. Carolyn Laskow, our district, district leader is keeping you to time. Thank you so much, Marion. Great, go. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Ayapi Sadi Tupac. I'm a social worker and a climate organizer and I'm running to represent Assembly District 65. In my time living on the Bowery, I have seen how developers have come on in knock down people's homes and build luxury condos in their place. Every day I wonder when a developer is gonna come on in, buy out my building and kick me out. This is a very real concern for me. Many of my neighbors are Chinese immigrants. They're delivery workers who work long shifts every day and come home late every night. My neighbors and I are at risk of being displaced and becoming another casualty to the sweeping housing crisis of lower Manhattan. But this instability is not new to me and not new to my family. My parents immigrated from Peru in the 80s, and when they first arrived to New York, my mom cleaned houses, my dad was a busboy at a restaurant. I was born in Mount Kisco, and as a kid, moved around a lot. Each time, my parents would struggle to find new jobs to survive. And after being displaced from our home in our apartment in Mount Kisco, we moved to a trailer park where I lived there for several years. These personal experiences with displacement are a big reason why I'm so passionate in my support of the Good Cause Bill in the state legislature which will protect renters from being evicted. And why I'll be continuing to support the Chinatown Working Group Plan, which will protect Chinatown and the Lower East Side from predatory development and displacement. I know how it is to be at the mercy of a system that does not care about the working class, does not care about immigrants, and this informs a lot of the organizing that I do. Big real estate wants to kick us out of our homes and fossil fuel companies want to push the costs of their businesses onto us. But we're gonna beat them by bringing together the working class folks of this district. I am proud to have the endorsement of the 9,000 member strong New York City chapter, the Democratic Socialist of America. The strength of DSA's endorsement 
is its huge volunteer numbers and the ability to greatly outperform the field operations of rival campaigns. At my field launch two months ago, we had over 100 volunteers who came out to knock on thousands of doors. And that was just our first day. Since then, we've been holding multiple field events every week in multiple languages. We have a huge head start and our field operation is only scaling up from here. Our campaign will knock 100,000 doors and talk to tens of thousands of voters. We've also gotten a lot of press coverage so far in City and State, The Independent, Jacobin, The Village Sun, and Impacto Latino. And we've been hard at work doing a lot of grassroots fundraising. We have received 1,800 contributions from more than 1,100 donors, raising just under $80,000 by the time of our, of our January filing deadline. Our campaign is run and funded by organizers and activists who are committed to our project, not by wealthy friends, consultants, or the Wall Street donor class. I'm so proud that our median donation is just $20. We were able to raise a large sum of money from really small donations, and that's because our campaign has an enormous level, enormous level of grassroots uh, support. Lower Manhattan is surrounded by water. Every projection shows that our district is ground zero for the climate crisis, but Albany and their wealthy backers see it as a sacrifice zone. It's why climate legislation and climate action is the heart of my organizing. Along with hundreds of thousands, hundreds of people in New York City, I fought to stop a frack gas pipeline in Astoria. And I was actually in court earlier today for putting my body on the line last summer while protesting in support of the Build Public Renewables Act. That's the kind of commitment you can expect from me in Albany. If we want New York to be a leader on climate, we need to elect a climate leader. Our campaign is fighting, the our, our campaign is fighting for universal health care, the New York Health Act, for workers' rights, through the sweat bill to stop wage theft, and for a Green New Deal through the Build Public Renewables Act. I won't only be fighting to fight state bills, I'm gonna to continue to support local issues too. I have proudly organized in support of the Chinatown Working Group Plan I've canvassed against displacement, I've supported the fight to save East River Park, and I've supported the fight against the mega jail. I've also proudly volunteered for local food delivery services during this pandemic. As you may know, I'm a social worker. I talk to members of my community every day. I see their struggles and I help my neighbors talk through poverty and addiction and mental health. This to me is not work only rooted in compassion and solidarity, but it's a job that fights for justice and equity. I am ready to take this commitment to Albany and together we will win. Thank you so much. Thank you, Iapa. Um, I would actually like to ask a question. I'm gonna ask you the same question um, that I asked Grace, which is um, how, are you, um, how are you seeing racism and injustice? And you talked about that some, but specifically, how are you see it playing out in our, our district and when you're in office, what can you do specifically to dismantle it? Totally. When I think about racism, I think in this country and specifically in this district, I think about how Seaport, how you know, it's it was really uh, founded on racism and slavery in the markets. And I think about New Amsterdam. I think about the history of Lenape people. This was their land, how it was taken from them. So unfortunately, this country and this city was founded on real big pillars of racism. Uh, more recently, we've all seen how there's been a really unfortunate increase in anti-Asian hate and violence. So as a legislator, I will totally, and as I have been at these rallies, I will support, I will speak to the justice, and I will support bills and legislati legislation that will be in, in, in support and advocating for these folks. Thank you. Melissa, I know you have, I know you had a question. You can't raise your hand as co-host. Hi, Lapa, how are you? Um, so I'm, my question is, you know, we have um, East River Park here and, you know, the park has been decimated. Um, and, you know, unfortunately we have to move past that right now and, and think about the air quality. Um, there are, I think there are two air monitors right now for the whole place and, you know, this is a very high asthma zone and there are lots of kids here. And I'm just wondering as a, an assembly member, how you would help protect us um, as the work goes on for the next few years. 
completely. I have proudly supported um, this fight against this destruction of Asia Park. I have, you know, canvassed in Vladek and public housing for this fight. I've spoken at these rallies and I will continue to advocate for this fight. It's unfortunate that this has happened and that uh, we have this illegal construction, uh, construction, right? It's gonna take over 10 years. They say it's gonna take three years, but we all know it's gonna take a decade. And this is the only park that many working class folks have. They're being exposed to all this toxic air and we won't even know the effects of this for years. So as, as a legislator, I will definitely be at these rallies. I know this is like, I know typically it's, 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 it's framed as um, like a rezoning or more city level fight, but for me, it doesn't matter because it, I don't see it that way. And, and any, I'm looking at maybe some bills or some ways where we could really advocate uh, and, and continue to shed light on this fight. And, this, and, the, and it's super important that we as a community consistently call um, truth to justice and, and call out what happened here. Cause it was a real failure of our system and a real failure of our city that they were able to, to really push ahead with their own plan when the community came up with the, the big U plan, which we were all in favor of. And, and then the city was like, oh no, we know better than you. And they, and they pushed ahead their own plan, which will destroy a thousand trees and uh, so many things that we know. But thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Uh, Laura. Hi, um, nice to meet you. Um, if there's one thing, if elected, if there's one thing you can accomplish in the assembly, if you had to choose just one thing, what would it be? Totally. So, so for me as a climate organizer and as an indigenous person, a lot of my organizing is, is predicated on defending mother earth or my, my culture Pachamama. And so for me, a Green New Deal and climate legislation is super, super integral to who I am as an organizer, who I am as a, who I hope to be as a legislator. And there is this bill called the Build Public Renewables Act, which I've been fighting for, which would really wean us off of the fossil fuel industry, which will create renewable energy and which will create thousands of union jobs. And I think this is the direction we need to be going in as lower Manhattan, because we're surrounded by water. The next time we get another Hurricane Sandy or another Hurricane Ida, we're going to get hit hard. So we had to be advocating for, for really important renewable energy and, and important climate legis uh, legislation. Thank you so much. Can you repeat the name of the act? Yes, that you it's, uh, yes of course. It's called the Build Public Renewables Act. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Iapa. Uh, Tommy Loeb. Hi, uh, good to meet you. Um, as you heard Bill Fern say, um, traffic is a big problem in our little hyper local area here on Grand Street. And when we recently met with or heard from DOT, they, they told us that congestion pricing is way, way off in, in terms mm -hmm. of implementation. And two things. Number one, what's your position on congestion pricing? And secondly, what's your position as it relates to this community regarding exemptions, or uh, how congestion pricing should be implemented uh, here on the Lower East Side. Completely, thank you for your question. I support congestion pricing. The fact is the majority of our district residents don't drive private vehicles and we don't need to prioritize movement for, our, and we need to prioritize movement for our most marginalized communities, the working class and the disabled. I don't think congestion pricing in of itself will solve our transportation and streets crisis. It's only a small part. And we need to massively rethink our car centric culture that puts the interests of fossil fuels and the wealthy ahead of public good and livable, safe, movable spaces and sustainability. And again, as a climate organizer, I know that we need to radically reshape not just energy, but car centric planning. And I support making public transit expansive, free and beautiful, uh, reclaiming public space in the form of super blocks, expanding and making permanent open streets programs and expanding green transportation methods like bike infrastructure. Some people will still choose to drive no matter what, but we're gonna do everything we can to make reliance on, on car culture uh, less necessary. Great, thank you. Uh, Magda Napoleon, please unmute yourself. I, I think I just did, I'm yep. sorry. You did, you did. Uh, um. So my question is, what's your stand on our homelessness? 
um, since the pandemic, um, it's become a real issue with homeless people literally moving into our NYCHA buildings, sleeping in our hallways, um, into our transit system. I mean, what's your stand as a social worker? Because this isn't just a homeless issue. It's a, a medical issue, a mental issue. Um, what's your really? stand on that? I'm really curious. Yeah. Excuse me, Ayapa. I just want to let you know this is three minutes now. So I think we could probably do one more question after this. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so when an individual loses their home and winds up on the streets, it's not their fault. Homelessness is a policy failure and, and it has a policy solution. It's the, it's the fault of every legislator sitting in office who could have done something to stop it, but they didn't. Uh, how does a person end up sleeping on the streets? They got kicked out of their apartment. That's why. And that's why I'm fighting for the good cause bill, which to prevent landlords from evicting their tenants and prevent them from unjust raises in rent. And if this bill passes, it's going to do an enormous amount to prevent homelessness. We need the good cause bill uh, in the short term. And after we pass that, we can exercise the state's power to build social housing that is green, comfortable, and beautiful to live in. Housing is a human right, and it's time that we treat it that way. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has a question? We still have uh, a minute. I'm going to ask you a very quick one. And mm -hmm. um, we talked about um, con traffic and congestion chest and pricing, but I would ask how you would solve transportation inequity in Assembly District 65. We have fewer buses and subways. And if you've been on the F train lately, you know that we don't have good yep. subway stations. Any thoughts about some specific things you could do to fix that? Yeah, I would definitely support the legislation for more buses. I think that many people do not have any access to, uh, otherwise without, for, for instance disabled people can't even access most subways which is a huge problem so it would obviously support um uh more disabled friendly uh transit systems and transit uh, stops in, in our in our city and and find a more equitable way of, of providing that for them and for those who who are, again are not car friendly and who, and who who deserve access to subways maybe they're outside of their their walking um approximation you have one minute left. That's great. So if you want to add anything, you know, yeah, I just want to thank, I want to thank everyone for, for giving me the space to perform and to speak and meet all of you. And, and if you see me on the streets, go come say hi to me and, and Marion, thank you for, for, for inviting me. And I have a lot of um, respect for this club and, and thanks again so much, honestly. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Okay, let's take a moment to exhale. <sighs> okay, um, so we have, um, oh, let me touch it, I lost, I'm on the wrong piece of paper now. Who's next? Who is next is um, Jasmine Sanchez. Jasmine, I think I saw you on the call, yes? I'm here. Okay, hi, Jasmine. So Hello. you also have 15 minutes. You can split that up between presentation and Q&A as you like. And Carolyn, as you have been seeing, is the timekeeper. So um, I um, just want to welcome you tonight and you can start when you like. Awesome, thank you. First and foremost, I wanna thank the Grand Street Dems for the work that you do in this community. Um, I'm happy to see so many familiar faces here, many of whom I have organized with and others from movement spaces. So I feel super comfortable and at home, even though I sound a little bit nervous, I'm not groomed, nor am I a politician, right? So you're gonna get raw Jasmine. Um, my name is Jasmine Sanchez and I'm a candidate for New York State Assembly in the, in the District 65. My story is the story of many people who live in this community. My grandparents migrated from Puerto Rico for better opportunities in housing, employment, education, and healthcare. They made their home at the old Spiro site and they were displaced. <clears throat> they moved to Orchard Street where their landlord burned the building to collect on the insurance. And it was then that they found their home in NYCHA where I was born and raised and still reside. This district is really unique. It is the place where Newman organized 10,000 residents in a historic red strike um, during an economic depression, causing mass unemployment and grinding poverty. 
We saw the rise of settlement houses here that cared for their neighbors, women like Wall, to ensure that residents received quality health care and lived in dignified conditions. And it's no wonder that this community, its members, all of you and I are resilient. It is in our nature. It is in the spirit of this community. I am a third generation Lower East Sider. I have been in this community for over four decades and have worked, volunteered, and organized in this community for 28 years. I am the proud product of the New York City public school system, having attended the local schools like PS 142, Junior High School 22, which is now Nest, and Lower East Side Prep, and worked and attended Henry Street Settlement. Um, while I was at Henry Street Settlement and Grand Street Settlement, I was a caseworker where I had a caseload of 110 young people. And it was there that I noticed that if I wanted to care for a young person, it wasn't only to provide resources and services to them, but I had to address the, the entire family. It has to be a holistic approach. And that has been my approach with everything that I do in life, right? And everything that I involve myself in. I was able to write grants and submit uh, proposals and get funds for after school programs, summer camps, um, softball leagues, et cetera. And that's because I was doing everything through an equitable lens. I know that there are um, a lot of conditions that plague our district as being one of the, the kids that grew up in this community, seeing a lot of our local staples being taken away or dwindling in resources and funds that I ensure that whenever we had an opportunity to invest in these same institutions, that it would be through a lens of what we had and not what we're, we're, we're just struggling to, to like uh, hold on to, right? I founded my own nonprofit organization in honor of my grandmother, the Ana Luisa Garcia Community Center, which provided um, internships and workforce development for young people and their families, as well as service learning opportunities. And anyone who knows me knows uh, a softball league, right? Uh, we have girls ages four to 18 years old from the Lower East Side, um, primarily from public housing. And, you know, it was a way for us to keep them engaged, to keep them doing well in their academics and to show them um, that they should love and care for their community but also um, being able to travel outside of the Lower East Side, which a lot of young people do not have the opportunity to do, right? So I think that that was something that was eye-opening for many. They still come back and coach our teams. They're still very active in our programs. And I think that, you know, this is the, the, the results of decades of work that we've all been doing here. I have led dozens of training seminars to educate residents on tenant rights as housing conditions in both NYCHA, Section 8, and other buildings have deteriorated through institutional neglect. I have represented public housing tenants at state assembly hearings, and I was part of the team that drafted federal legislation for a Green New Deal for public housing experience and expertise that I look forward to implementing in Albany, right? Um, I attended, um, I, I made sure that I attended every meeting that had to do with the issues that were affecting our community, whether that was um, transit, whether that was um, parks, whether that's young people, um, because it's great to know everything that's happening in this district so that you can see how things are interconnected. Folks think that, you know, one thing is happening here, it's completely different from what's going on. Everything is interconnected and people need to start looking at that through that lens. Um, for Superstorm Sandy, my development was impacted um, severely. We went without heat, hot water for close to six weeks. Um, and it was then that I decided to recruit volunteers from across the city um, through sorority and fraternity networks to bring in volunteers to make sure that everyone in our communities um, had the things that they needed, if they needed food, get them the food, and we developed a database. So when the pandemic hit, it was a no-brainer that we had access to this database that we constructed and implemented during Sandy, um, and we went into full force and did that, and along with several Lower East Side residents from public housing on um, the East Village and um, Chinatown, we started the Lower East Side Mutual Aid Network, um, which is a network of community organizations and volunteers that provided 14,000 meals to over 5,000 residents of Chinatown, Two Bridges, LES, and the East Village at the onset of the pandemic. Um, and recently, I helped lead the food distribution systems on Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's 2020 campaign. Um, I developed the infrastructure for that. Um, I worked alongside organizers, training her field team, training um, all of the directors there so that they knew what they had to do from distribution of food, masks, and actually brought in resources to the Bronx and Queens. Um, and in addition to that, 
that I've been working with Sunrise National on a Green New Deal for public housing after the much success at the New York City level um, focus on having them participate in the East River um, fight, but also on the Green New Deal for public housing. Um, lastly, the, the vision for this campaign movement and office begins with a commitment to education, um, inclusion and transformation as a pathway for the district to be empowered to continue organizing and to take action towards building a multiracial working class that combats injustice and inequality. Our district is one third rent burdened, one fifth severely rent burdened and has 10,296 NYCHA units, which is why the right to remain good cause and a Green New Deal for NYCHA will be key for the stability of housing in district. Um, our community is still recovering from Superstorm Sandy, which is why we'll prioritize the climate can't wait bills at the state level. I'm happy to share that with uh, Marion so that everyone can get that. Um, and hate crimes have increased in the district, right? And what I do very well is build coalition and organize and work with folks. And this will be no different. I will work with schools, faith-based institutions, tenant associations and organizations to implement race class narrative project that is being um, promoted by the Working Families Party um, and also push for the, the uh, release of the funding um, the 10 billion in emergency funding for the AAIP, uh, AAPI community to recover, heal and grow stronger. Um, and lastly, we must end the 24 hour workday and eight and end wage theft. I will push for the passages um, that are currently um, in Albany. Um, as a CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies student, labor is a priority on this campaign because it affects the stability of every family and person in district. And um, all of this will be accomplished by co-governing, right? With residents, with organizations, small businesses and groups on the ground to develop the path forward to thrive in 65. I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen that hashtag. Um, it's how we're gonna get through you know, the next few years coming out of the pandemic, but the, honestly speaking, there were um, issues in this district prior to, right? So we wanna make sure that um, if we're talking about reinforcing and developing, strengthening um, Assembly District 65, that we do so with love, with communication and transparency, and that it is coming from a space where we're building um, our capacity, people power, because I can't go to Albany and legislate, right? I need y'all on a bus, up there with me in Albany, right? To make sure that we're doing this work. And that is the energy, that is the, the movement that we're looking to build here, um, which has always already been here, right? But we wanna make sure that it's, it's going to remain and that it's gonna be here for future generations to come. Um, and with that, I guess I'll seize the rest of my time. <laughs> Wow, I don't know how, much, how many more questions we can ask. You've uh, given us a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I have one, and I, you may have mentioned it, and I missed it. I was trying to keep up with you. Do you support the Chinatown Working Group zoning plan? Absolutely. Um, I remember back in 2009 when I worked for former State Senator Daniel Squadron, I was actually assigned to attend um, those meetings. And it, it was really interesting to me to learn more about it because I was away at Stony Brook. Um, but absolutely, I think that the solutions implemented there that, that basically this plan is gonna guide development to ensure that new housing and commercial space reflect local affordability and need is really important, right? When we're talking about the AMI, when we're talking about all of these things, like we know that we can be displaced. We know that this is not gonna be a place where we can go to small businesses, they, they won't be here, right? Um, we wanna make sure that these small businesses are still thriving, that they're not priced out um, and that residents can, can stay here, right? And normally when things happen, like we look at one Manhattan square, it changes the character of, of our district, right? But it also lends to the fact that, you know, it, if we had this Chinatown working group plan in effect, that wouldn't be there, right? That building would not be there. Um, and we want to make sure that um, we are uh, supporting that plan 100%. Um, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, we just signed a resolution supporting the plan as a club last month. So I'm very pleased with that. Uh, Melissa, did you want to ask your other question? You know what, I see so many hands up. I'm going to yield the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to start from who hasn't spoken before, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, Emily, do you want to ask a question? 
Oh, hey there, everyone. Sorry, I'm not um, on the video. I actually don't have a question, but I would love to speak in support of Jasmine if this is the right place to do that or the right time to do that. Uh, no, we're going to do endorsements okay. next month. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. The right place yeah. to do that. Well, I do. I do have a, then a question, Jasmine, because um, I know that you are. Uh, you know, when we met, you were leading the BLM march and um, in solidarity with environmental justice. And knowing what has occurred at East River Park and knowing your fight um, to help protect East River Park, just want to hear a little bit more about your thoughts regarding environmental justice and this fight and kind of where you see the true resiliency that might come forward from the destruction that we all know has happened, but how our communities can galvanize with you, uh, both here on the ground and on the front lines and in, Al and in Albany together. Yeah. Hi, Sorry, Emily. Jasmine, I yeah. let you, this is now th just about three minutes. Okay. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Really quickly. No. Uh, <laughs> <as a> public, <laughs> really quickly. Less than thirty seconds. As a public housing resident, um, I was affected by Sandy and was part of the initial plan, um, the initial group, um, East River Action, and then the East River Park Action to bring attention to the injustices of uh, environmental injustice to Black, Brown, and Latinx people in this community, as well as the dangers of not having um, our trees right in the East River Park. Um, being someone that didn't have the the ability to travel to Florida, go to like Central Park, the East River Park was the closest thing that I got. It's where I grew up playing softball, right? Um, so for me, the the direct link with uh, racial and environmental justice are tied. Um, and I feel that this plan did not take into account the voices of public housing residents. We received over 3,000 um, signatures um, from public housing residents indicating that you know, this plan needed to be halted, they needed to be observed, you know, the, the air quality was a concern, the fact that there are rodents in public housing right now because of previous FEMA funding and construction and now what's going to happen when the East River Park um, um, gets, begins to get destroyed, which it already is, right? Um, none of those questions were answered by DDC. So what I feel is, is that I will not be silent. I know that this fight has always been pushed back on the city, but at the end of the day, there were surveys that needed to be conducted. There were um, uh, environmental studies um, and, and there's a voice and we have a voice. And I would never say that I'm going to follow suit. Um, I think that there has to be a lot of investigation and exploration and conversations in community so that um, we know how to move forward as a community, right? And that's something that was not happening here, nor were these concerns ever discussed um, with the people that it was going to imp be impacting. More than 30 seconds, I'm sorry. Great, thank you. Harriet. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can yeah. hear me? Yes. Jasmine, thank you. You have a tremendous amount of energy and I'm hearing a, a lot of information about the work you've done and plan on doing for public housing. My question is this, there are a lot of people in this district that are not living in public housing. There are a lot of people that I think feel that their voices are not heard because they are not at a, at a low income level. Do you feel that you can address people that are not in that category and to somehow try to bridge the, the, the communication gap, even amongst people who are of higher income, middle income and lower income. And, you know, people just sort of feel like uh, they're not gonna listen to me, they don't care. So can you address that? Please. Yeah, absolutely. So I've always operated from a space of exclusion, right? Because I feel that folks exclude uh, public housing residents. So um, in this campaign and in all the work that I've ever done, I've included every single person um, that has wanted to participate in anything that we're doing, regardless of where you're from, regardless of your race, your class, your background, et cetera. Um, and that's something that I have a proven success record in. Um, I speak about public housing only because it's my residence, it's my lived, ex it's my lived experience, but it's not what I advocate for, right? Like I understand that housing affects everyone. I understand that employment affects everyone. Um, and I 
definitely be able to bring folks into that conversation. And it comes from having this open dialogue, right? For me, the campaign is launching our listening tours, and that's going to happen throughout every part of the district because there needs to be bridges sorry, within. I'm sorry, Jasmine. I'm so sorry. That's time. We're over time oh, now. Time. But okay. Harriet and Jasmine, please continue to talk and, and finish answering that question. Of I think course. it's a very valid question. Thanks, Harriet. Jasmine, thank you so much thank for thank being you, with us tonight. And um, we wish you very good luck in your campaign. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, exhale. So we have one more candidate for assembly, and that is Justine Cuccia. Cuccia? Um, Justine. Cuccia, you, you've got it. Nice Italian name. Very <laughs> nice to see you, and thank you for having me. Nice okay. So um, like with everyone else, you have 15 minutes. You see Carolyn will hold you to time. You can use that time however you want between presentation and Q&A. Um, and I will ask everyone asking questions to keep your questions succinct and Justine to keep your answers succinct so we can get more information. Certainly, I will do my best. All You're right, on. I'm You're on. on. Well, yeah. good evening and thank you for having me. My name is Justine Kucha and I've lived in Lower Manhattan since the mid 1990s when Battery Park City was a frontier town. I came here as a recently divorced single mom because the location allowed me to walk to work. And that meant I could visit my daughter at daycare, spend more time with her in the mornings and evenings instead of commuting hours each day. I know what it is to struggle and I know what it means to face uncertainty. As a Battery Park City matured into a middle-class enclave, I also learned what community is and it happens when we come together. I partnered with other single moms, all of whom knew one thing. We weren't going to make it on our own, but we did stand a chance of surviving as a team by picking up each other's kids from daycare and then after school, arranging play dates and group dinners. Sorry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Group dinners, helping with homework. And we found that ways not only to get by, but to thrive. And by covering for each other as, we, as time moved on, for date nights, we also began new relationships and that led to second marriages and more kids for each of us. It takes a village and we built one. During those years, I also became a proud mom, proud public school mom between two daughters, the second one born two weeks after 9-11, 2001, our family attended five different public schools in Lower Manhattan while, growing, while our growing family squeezed four people and two dogs into our 900 square foot apartment with one shower. But one sunny afternoon, there was a sound like thunder outside our window. And my then eight-year-old daughter said, Mommy, the World Trade Center is on fire. Like most all of you, my world changed that day forever. On 9-11-2001, after the initial acts of terrorism, what I saw around me were people helping people. And that was my call to action. In the community served by the Grand Street Democrats, and in the people who spoke before me, I'm hearing a call to action and I'm seeing a real need for action. So starting out, why has this community been allowed to languish as a transit desert? It's true that even the most powerful state legislator cannot get a new subway built, but it is up to the state to decide which subway stations should be renovated, expanded and made accessible for the elderly, handicapped and parents with small children. And it is up to the state to decide which stations should be served by more trains, which communities should get additional bus lines and more frequent service. And I will fight for each of these priorities for your neighborhood because you need it. And why was your East River Park closed and taken away from you for, for who knows how many years of construction, two, five, it, it ten, be taken for eight, five and 10 years. That's what I think, exactly. Uh, and with no real community engagement, the plan that was set forth that was the community participated in. That's right, that's right. Out the window. The resiliency plans for the financial district and Battery Park City, other side of, the, of your, you know, the west side of, of uh, Manhattan have been discussed and disclosed at countless public meetings and the communities there were consulted and given a media, meaningful voice in the dis discussion. The fact that you weren't given the same respect looked like that is blatant discrimination in my eyes and it's not okay. Why have you been given no meaningful protection against the gentrification that's sure to follow the developments planned for two bridges? 
as a state lawmaker, I want to push for enforceable guarantees that residents will not be displaced and the fabric of this community will remain intact. I had the pleasure of walking around with, with Marion and, and Sandra the other day, last week, and I saw what this community is by Ground Street and by your neighborhood. I was impressed and awed by the amount of connection and connectivity that you all have. A um, little bit of what happens in Battery Park City happening there. So it was really lovely and I thank you for the time doing that. Um, but here's an example of what I'm working on now in my world when my only power is to persuade rather than make laws or allocate funds. The Coalition for 100% Affordability at Five World Trade Center is fighting to stop a billion dollar giveaway of publicly owned lands and instead build more than 1,000 units of affordable housing on that land. As you all may know, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation and Port Authority of New York and New Jersey have proposed building a new luxury residential tower, squandering the opportunity to, opportunity to provide desperately needed affordable housing in Lower Manhattan. Now you may ask, why does that affect you or how does it affect you? Well, our coalition at Five World Trade Center defines affordable, not only in economic, but also in geographic terms. We want permanent and inclusive housing for low, moderate and middle income families. And we want a preference given to 9-11 survivors with their children and seniors. Most importantly, this means everybody who lived or worked in Chinatown, in Fidei, Tribeca, the Lower East Side and Battery Park City on that day. This means you. The last thing that Lower Manhattan needs is more astronomically expensive luxury apartments when so many are vacant right now and the supply of affordable housing is exponentially shrinking. None of us deserves to be priced out of our home. So that, it, that is exactly what two decades of bad policy have achieved for downtown residents. Massive giveaways to real estate interests. It's happening now in Battery Park City where I live. It's happening now in two bridges in Chinatown, in the Lower East Side and in Southbridge and the South Street Seaport. And it soon will be happening to Five World Trade Center if a bad plan is allowed to move forward. And this is true for owners as well as renters. Whether you live in a co-op on Grand Street or a condo in Five Fidei, your property taxes have increased by double digits in recent years. It's not sustainable, not for middle income and fixed income homeowners, and it must stop. I have been and will continue to fight for all of our neighborhoods to have room for people to, uh, who occupy every rung of the economic ladder. We have no shortage of millionaires in Lower Manhattan, but they should live alongside the middle class, working class, and people who need help from all classes. I want downtown to be a place where teachers and firemen and nurses can live alongside bankers and physicians, where both these groups see the less fortunate as neighbors rather than strangers. Doormen and home health, aid, home health aides should be able to walk to work rather than commuting for hours. This vision may please some of you and provoke others, what I'm gonna say right now, but there is room in my definition for affordable housing for people who would otherwise be sleeping on our streets. To be clear, I am talking about managing growth rather than re-engineering the status quo. I don't think a single resident of Lower Manhattan, rich or poor or in between, should have to leave their current homes. I just want us to welcome in a broader range of new neighbors as we figure out who comes here next. But there's more. Garbage piled high on the streets of Chinatown, NYCHA, rats endangering the health of our children, apartments with no heat or hot water, where residents are forced to live in unlivable conditions. Small businesses are being forced to shut their doors. These speak to affordability in the sense that we can't afford to keep getting it wrong. They cry out for funding and legislative action, but above all, they cry out for leadership and that is what I'm here to provide. Why should you believe that I should accomplish any of this? Because of what I have already done. I've driven a, I drove a successful campaign, protest campaign that stopped Brookfield Properties from demolishing the Winter Garden Staircase back in 2011. I led a grassroots push that enacted a law in 2017 requiring two community residents to be appointed to the board of the Battery Park City Authority. And now I am pushing for a new law that will guarantee residents a majority of those seats. In the meantime, excuse me, as a member of Community Board One for almost a dec decade, I've guided the a new relationship with the Battery Park City Authority with the neighborhood and have made them more accountable and transparent than ever be before. I've worked to structure a process of formulating resiliency measures so that the community has been consulted every step of the way. And last summer, I was part of a team that paused the saws and stopped then Governor Cuomo in his tracks 
from building the essential workers monument on parkland that our children need. I have fought for smaller class size and more schools to combat overcrowding. I have fought and won fought for and won traffic calming measures on our streets, right turn lanes and signals along the West Side Highway. And every one of these things either made lives better or saved lives. And keep in mind though, everything I've said, none of this did I do by myself. My skill as a leader hinges on building teams, forging consensus and mobilizing communities to fight for what is right. Um, and how will I use the seat in the assembly to serve these priorities? Well, I will try the opposite of what government officials usually do with you. I want to listen to what you need rather than telling you what you mu must be done. Thank you. Great, thank you, Justine. Again, you gave us a lot of information. Sorry, so, talked too much. <laughs> no, no, information is what we're here to, to do. Thank you. Uh, Melissa has a question. Uh, Erin, thanks for coming tonight. Um, you mentioned garbage. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, like much of New York City, we have a rat problem here. The sanitation um, bins in our neighborhood here, they are the ones that, um, I don't know, open like this and close, and they actually don't close at all. So, you know, uh, it doesn't help with our rat problem, and there's garbage all over the street. <laughs> so, um, we also don't have recycling um, bins on their streets here. So, I mean, is, I don't know if this is something, that is, but what would you do? <laughs> what would I do? Um, okay, so I don't know if that is a city or state function, but right. I could tell you right now that we need to allocate funds to take care of that because what we have, what, what, what exists, okay, and I know it exists, are garbage, um, rodent-proof garbage cans, whether they are the ones where you step on it so your hands don't have to touch the, the garbage, the lid to come open, or the ones where you just push in, um, they do keep the rodents out, whether it's rats or squirrels. Now that doesn't mean that in Battery Park City or Fidei or, or uh, Tribeca even, okay, that we don't have rats. We do, but it helps. It helps, and that's step one. Um, I, what I think kind of gets me crazy is the fact that you don't have any of that stuff there. I cannot imagine it's that expensive to get it, the technology exists, and what I would like to do is to bring that technology to you. Um, yeah, so my answer is that. I think it's funding, but I think it's also knowledge and getting getting it there. You need it, let's get it to you. Thank Great. you. For that Thank question. you. And thanks for that question, Melissa. So, um, Fanny. Hi, Fanny. Hi. Hi. Um, so, you live in Battery Park City, and I hear that you've done a lot of stuff on the west side. Um, being an east side residence, resident, um, I'm just curious, um, can you name something that you've done and was involved in that was on the east side and the low east side? Um, I have done things, like I said, through community board one and, and through getting involved with things, but I have been involved in protesting against the, the, the next jail. I have worked to, um, I've supported and attended rallies with the Chinatown Working Group. I support that. Um, I think the Five World Trade Center will benefit the Lower East Side. And so I have been fighting really long and hard for the affordable housing to be 100% there because everybody on the Lower East Side is a, a nine, well, everybody who lived in the Lower East Side or worked on 9-11 in the, in the zone is a 9-11 uh, survivor and they are part of the group we wanna protect. Um, That's your, and, uh, three minute warning. You have three minutes ooh. left. Okay. I mean, just yeah, just quickly. Um, you know, we've got the Green New Deal. We've got universal health care. Health care. Good cause eviction. I support all of those things. Um, again, as in my capacity now, I have no no um, legislative power at all. I have a voice, and I use it, and I have used it. Thank you for your question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Lauda, and then Bill. Again, short. Short and sweet for both you and Justine. We can get both questions. Okay. Nice to meet you. If if you are uh, elected, what would be the one one priority if you had to choose just one um, to to pass in the assembly? Good cause eviction. I, my biggest my biggest fight is for affordability for all levels of people, all levels of income. You know, low, middle, moderate. Uh, Good cause eviction. 
Great, thank you. And Bill so, Ferns. Hi, Justine. So uh, I like a lot of your, your your activities. I my ear perked up when I said you managed to get like uh, right turn cameras. So uh, I'm just sort of curious how how you strategize with the Department of Transportation around that. Lots of long conversations. I did not do it alone. Um, we got right turn signals. Okay, so so um, trigger warning to people. Um, in part, we got attention because of the terrorist that drove his truck down the West Side Highway on the bike path on the West Side. Um, so that kind of brought attention to us. Sorry, it chokes me up. I'm sorry, those poor people. Um, but also before that and after that, people were bicycle bicyclists were killed um, by motorists who were turning right as they were going straight. And it's almost like they both had the right of way. So it's sadly, um, people had to die. I think Marion, you and I talked about this. <laughs> um, people have to die. It's really disgusting that people have to die, but that, you know, it's pushing and pushing and pushing. And I guess that kind of brings me to like, even going back to the Winter Garden Staircase, it was something that was really important to me to have that. It was important to our neighborhood after 9-11 the, 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 to keep it and a private, private, public, a private entity wanted to get rid of it just because they wanted to get rid of it and the community said no. And how did we stop it? By not going away, like a dog with a bone, you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So for every step of the way, and again, the more you push, the more annoying you are, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and the more elected officials and the more government agencies see you, hear you, decide maybe you've got a point, you win people over to your side and then things get done. So I guess that's what I would bring to the table is, is my tenacity and my willingness to just keep going. And Thank there's you. Bill. No, you're welcome. Wow, and that was just on time. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming. So we have now seen all our candidates for Assembly District 65. And I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, I also wanna remind you that we did see you lean new tonight as candidate for State Senate um, District 26. We've also seen our incumbent Brian Kavanaugh and uh, our other candidate was Victoria Fariello and she came to us in our December meeting. So I just wanna remind us because things have gotten stretched out here. So let's... Um, Let's uh, take another exhale. We have three candidates here tonight for state, uh, state committee. And something I hope somebody says they're gonna fight for is to stop this one male, one female. Um, uh, I'm sorry, my phone is doing ridiculous things. One, one male, one female candidate. So I wonder what happens if somebody is uh, gender non-binary. Um, but I don't think we're there tonight, but I certainly think that's something we could um, face in the future. So uh, we have, is Joshua Goodman here? Good evening, Marion, how are you? Hi, Joshua, why don't we start with you? Again, you have 15 uh, minutes. You can sort it out between questions and uh, presentation as you like, and Carolyn will keep you honest to time. Great, thank you so much, Marion. Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Josh Goodman. I'm uh, candidate for state committee 8065 male to represent us on the state committee of the Democratic Party. So I'm going to just take a minute and start with what is the state committee, if you don't mind. This is obviously a very high information group. And even among the 50 of us, there are probably a few people who are maybe familiar with this role and not 100% sure what it does. So as the um, state committee candidate going first, I'll just kind of set the bar on that. So the New York State Democratic Party is governed by a central committee made up of approximately 300 people. This is the state committee. This is what we're referring to. It's generally speaking, two people per assembly district. As Marion mentioned, one male and one female. And I, was, I mean, I actually am gonna to speak to that a little bit. Um, the reason that the, even though there's 150 assembly districts, that there are slightly more than 300 state committee members is some of the uh, assembly districts upstate that are geographically very large get an extra set. But in the city, it's two people per assembly district, one male and one female. Um, this is a body that has really, as I see it, two roles, and, I, and then I'll get into my background and, and why I'm running. Um, one is to be the decision-making body of the state party, uh, to elect the chair of the state party, to determine fundraising strategy, to set the budget and determine how that money is spent, 
to make sure that our state party is doing its job of supporting progressive candidates up and down the ballot. And then the other role is sort of a more local role, sort of a bully pulpit. We'll come back to that. Um, so our current state committee member, Mail, is Chris Martin. Chris has to give this up as a city council member. And knowing that he couldn't run again, he encouraged me to run. And I, you know, something that I um, obviously had to give a lot of thought to. And the thing that really pushed me forward was many of you remember this past November, the three ballot measures to do with voting rights, measures one, three, and four failed unexpectedly, right? All of us down here in the city thought this was a lock. We weren't doing anything. We weren't worried about it for the most part. And then little did most of us know the Republicans upstate were spending big money to defeat these measures and they succeeded. And the state party chair, Jay Jacobs, said, well, I didn't know either, nobody ever asked me. Mike Gennaris, the state senator from Queens, produced emails showing that he raised this flag for Jay Jacobs, that he asked the state party to spend money on these ballot measures and the state party refused. So we have a problem that I'd like to address, which is that the state committee is currently a rubber stamp for state party leadership, the state party chair, Jay Jacobs, who's ultimately appointed by the governor. And regardless of what you think about the governor, when she said, I will get rid of anyone who had ties to Cuomo, who had defended Cuomo, for some reason, she decided that that uh, ex exempts Jay Jacobs, the state party chair. This latest fundraising filing that just came out today, we're now able to see you know, what everybody raised over the last several months. One of the things we can see is who gave money to Andrew Cuomo in the period between when he was first accused and when he stepped down. A week and a half before he resigned, $5,000 from Jay Jacobs. Like, I just don't understand how you can continue to defend this person. And yet most of our state committee, the 300 people who represent uh, us in the state party, continue to support him. And so we need independent leadership in the state committee. And, and that's why I ultimately decided to go forward with running is, is to try to bring that. And there is a sort of a progressive insurgent caucus within the state party. Um, it's a small group. It will be a long time before it can affect real change, uh, but it includes a lot of people from Western Queens, some people from the Finger Lakes region, a few people from Western New York, including some that I've worked with before. So I think I can be a good ally to those folks in trying to make a difference. And one of the things that they are working on is changing these gender rules. And so let me just come back to that and, and then we'll go into questions. Um, so the idea behind having one male and one female was seen as like a very progressive idea when it was created in the 1940s. Oh, we'll make sure that the state committee is at least half women. But obviously, I didn't see background noise from Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, it, exclu it excludes anybody with a non-binary gender identity. So there is a group uh, led by Amelia Decauden, who's a, a state committee member from Western Queens, to change this rule and allow uh, to require 50% to be women and then to have it be, instead of male and female, to have it be female and other than female. And that way, uh, people with non-binary gender identities would be able to serve on the state committee while we would still preserve the 50% um, women threshold that we've wanted for the last 100 years. Um, and then just really quickly about me. So I live uh, just a few blocks from most of you. I'm in Chinatown, on the east side of Chinatown, right under the Manhattan Bridge, at the corner of Market and Madison. You may have seen me and my dog in Seward Park um, on a pretty regular basis. I serve as the grassroots committee chair of DID. And um, you know I see this role as basically being the grassroots committee chair for the district, helping to elect progressive candidates, helping to turn our people out. And, and the main thing that I wanna do, and then I'm really gonna stop and, and take some questions. The main thing that I wanna do locally is there's a very high bar to knowing what this is. Like, you're all hearing from me now about what state committee is and does, but to even hear that, you have to know what a democratic club is and does. And you have to like have known to come to this meeting. So um, doing a lot more local outreach, you know, we at DID have this really nice one pager that explains like, what is a democratic club? How is it different from a book club or a civic association? Like, why should you get involved? Tabling events on the Lower East Side in the community where I live, you know, I wanna be out at Grand and Clinton, you know, I wanna be out at Madison Rutgers giving these out, making sure that people know that there are people who represent them in the state party. There are people who represent them at the hyper-local level. And as we all know, you really only have to get onto a couple of Zooms before you become in like the top five percentile um, activist uh, before you're head and shoulders above everybody else. So I'm excited to work with you all. Obviously, I, I've been to so many great Grand Street events over the years, and it's great to see so many friends and colleagues on here. And I hope I can earn your support, and I'd love to take some questions. All right, I, I'm going to take advantage of, um, I see one hand, but I'm, I'm just a very quick question. 
and your response to the male female problem. I just wonder if half female, does that include trans women? Yes, it does already. That will not require a rules change. You run in the gender identity that you identify with. Okay, all right, that's that's my question. Thank you. Um, Bill? Uh, hi, Josh. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks for talking about Jay Jacobs. Uh, could you talk, uh, maybe mention also your position on how uh, he engineered getting third third parties uh, on the ballots? Yeah, so this was um, one of those classic Cuomo scams, and it seems like there were so many over the years that they all sort of run together, where they required a higher, so New York, let me go back up a little bit. New York has a system that's not totally unique in the country. South Carolina has it too, and I think there might be one other state, fusion voting, right, where multiple parties can support the same candidate. And this has had, it's just a weird system. It's got its ups and downs. But one thing that's great about it is it allows minor parties to uh, sort of move the conversation, right? So like, I can vote for, you know, uh, I can't, if there's a candidate, like I, this is what I, did. I voted for Joe Biden on the Working Families Party line, because I wanted to say, well, of course I support Joe Biden, but at the same time, I want to send a message that it's important that they prioritize progressive ideas going forward, right? So it's a great system that lets us sort of send a message with our vote. Jay Jacobs and Governor Cuomo have always hated the system and really tried to get rid of it. And they made a um, higher threshold for these parties to continue to exist. That used to be that I believe they needed um, like two, were one and a half or 2% of the statewide vote in the gubernatorial election, and they upped it to four and a half percent. The idea being basically just to target the Working Families Party and try to get rid of them. You know, it was terrible. It was all about consolidating power for these guys. And the fact that there's been no accountability for that, like, Working families had to pull out all the stops to survive the 2018 election. They did, but like, how come there's been no talk about reversing these rules changes and accountability for Jay Jacobs for being behind this? I would love to address that and really unwind some of that work that he did over the last several years. Great, thank you. Keen Berger. Um, yes, you said, I'm a big Chris Marty fan. Um, you said he encouraged you to run. Did he encourage you more than he encouraged everybody else to see, or you got his endorsement? What's the story? You know, I don't, I appreciate that, Keenan. He's, he's on the line. I don't want to get ahead of him. I mean, you know, uh, Chris, jump in if you think I'm overselling this here. Chris told me he thought I would be a good candidate. His opinion means a lot to me. There is no other candidate at the moment. So that tells you a little something about his encouragement of other people. Right, Keen, um, Josh is on a post as the male Still, candidate I mean, for I can state picture, committee. Yeah, thank you. But I can picture Chris being neutral about somebody. But sure, of course. I, and, I, and I don't want to jump the gun, you know. I mean, uh, look, Chris and Kenny and I went shuffleboarding on Sunday. And um, we mostly talked about, you know, like our shuffleboard scores. I didn't ask him for his endorsement yet. I think that a lot of people in our district expect Chris to sort of carry them over the finish line. Um, and uh, I just sort of wanted to give the context that he's the incumbent, he's not running again. And, um, you know, I really hope that I can continue his record of being an activist state committee member. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Harriet, Taj, do you have a question? After, if you do, after Harriet, please. Okay, yes, I have okay. a question. You know that you know. No, no, Taj. I've called on Harriet. Let's let her go, and then you. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. That's okay. Thank, thank you. I have a sort of a two-part question. Um, do you do you believe, and I think this is happening, that there's a push for a lot of um, Republicans to register as Democrats and and have some kind of a, you know anti-progressive, anti-democratic influence on a lot of decision-making. Um, I, I know that we had a big problem with the independent democratic caucus in, in um, the assembly. And hopefully, you know, we resolved that problem, but do you think there's a problem? And do you feel that you can be proactive? I think educating people as far as what you do and, and what the Democratic Party does and and just civics education for 
you know, just everyday people in the district and sure. New York State. Look, on the first part, I think that it's a it's a really frustrating. I worked in the state Senate during the IDC years um, for a regular Democratic senator, and it was so frustrating having to deal with them. Um, it's certainly an issue that there are many people in New York State who register as Democrats. I don't know whether they're Republicans doing it purposefully to monkey with the system, or they're just people who don't share values. But, th but there are a lot of people who just know, well, the Democratic primary is what matters, so I'm going to register as a Democrat. I mean, I think of this way about even somebody like Jay Jacobs, right? Like, this guy's the state party chair. Look at what he believes in. I don't think his values are the same as mine. I don't, I don't know why he would be like, you know, uh, a, a Democratic activist in any other state. So many people get involved in Democratic Party politics in New York just because that's where the action is. And I do think that we have to be proactive about saying, look, well, let me put it to you this. That's your three minutes. You've got three minutes left, Josh. Okay, I'm going to get through this question and the next one too. I, I, let me put it to you this way. If I'm, a, I'm a, as involved of a Democrat as you can be, right? And, and, and so is everybody on this call. If I were to ask you, what is one thing that a Democrat must believe or else you can't be a Democrat? I don't know that we could come up with an answer. It's a major problem. Right? We say, okay, you have to be you know, pro-choice. There are anti-choice Democrats. Well, you have to be for taxes on the rich. There are plenty of Democrats who oppose that. You have to support a higher minimum wage. Plenty of Democrats oppose that too. So we have this major problem. I mean, I love that we're a big tent, right? But there is no single, po I'm not talking about values. So we stand with working people, whatever. But there is no single policy position where we say, if you don't agree with us on this, you're out of the party. And at a certain point, that becomes a problem. Like obviously purity tests backfire, but you have to be able to say, you know, the voting rights, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, or, you know, you have to be able to say there's something. You must believe this. And if you don't, you can't be one of us. And we don't currently do that. I think that's a problem. It's not my decision to say what that issue is, but it shows you some of the issues that we struggle with. Uh, and then on your other question about civic education, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, Joshua, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to move ahead because I told Josh. Taj I'm giving to it a up. thumbs up on civic education. We can talk more about it. Okay, Taj, you're on. We can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have a question for Josh? Yes. Okay. Uh, I talk about the community gathering from the East River Park. No. The, we, if you have a question for Josh, you can take the time for that. Uh, I got a question to Josh. Okay. I talk about the whole park areas, the East River Park. They cut down the whole trees. This, what's what's the question, Tosh? What's the question? I, mean, talk I can about definitely talk about my feelings about East River Park, you know, and what I yeah, would yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. I know it. It was sad because they shut, they, a lot of people would cut down the trees. You know, I'll tell you, it was heartbreaking for me the the day after they started when they chained up the entrance to the park. You know, I know what was happening, right? But my dog pulled me right over there. He loves to walk through that park. And just seeing that look, I, this is going to sound insane, I'm sorry, but seeing that look in her eyes when she's like looking up and being like, why can't we go into the park? And like knowing that there's no way to explain to her that 10 years from now, I don't, you know, dogs don't always live that long. Like she's already six years old, you know? Will she be here to see the, the park reopen? It really broke my heart. And, and that's just, I know we all have been through it on this issue. We don't have to get into it again, but that was just sort of my East River Park story. Um, anyway, I, I know I'm out of time. I'm gonna put my contact info in the chat. Uh, you know, it's really important to me to be accessible um, on all of this. And, and hopefully if, if I'm honored enough to earn your support and then be elected, hope we can work together. And I really um, am excited for all the stuff that we can do together. So thank you so much for having me. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Taj. Okay, we have two more. We have both of our female candidates for state committee. And I'm, that is not a response to either of the candidates we have here, but to my feelings about how we have split this up. Um, so I'll, I'll be glad to see some changes. <clears throat> so our, the first candidate we have scheduled is Jenny Lowe. Jenny is our is currently the female um, state committee member and is running for re-election. Jenny, are you here? Yes, I am. Hi, Marianne. Okay. Hi, Hi, everyone. Jenny. 
So Jenny, again, you you've probably heard this. You have 15 minutes. You see Carolyn's going to cut you off at 15 minutes. You can split it up between presentation and Q&A as you like. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me tonight. I know it's a long evening for you folks. Um, I, um, as Ma Marion said, I am Jenny Lowe. I'm the state committee person uh, representing the female part of the state committee uh, from 65 Assembly District. I've been um, a state committee member since 2014. And I um, have been uh, representing the 65th Assembly District and um, in, in that capacity. And I ser served with uh, Lee Berman for two years, uh, who was elected uh, in 2016. Um, I've been working in the district for and living in the district and volunteering in the district for now 46 years. I came to the country when I was 12 and um, went to public school, learned English, worked on the weekends in a tiny little coffee shop in Chinatown, I went to public school and went to Brooklyn Tech. And then I went to Yale. I came back after going to Yale with a uh, graduating cum laude with a degree of applied math and management science. I came back because this is the community that raised me. And I wanted to give back to the community and pay it forward because others have paid it forward when I came to the country. When I came to the country, I was lucky enough to have bilingual education where I can learn English. And I feel that this community still needs the help. It's not just about the Asian American, it is about the Latino, the um, African American, and those who are living in low income, in the low income uh, housing in our district. I have been working with them side by side um, I'm just going to say go, uh, I've been volunteering as a Democratic uh, uh, member of UDO since I was 13 years old, following the teacher, uh, in, I'm a teacher of my in middle school, Virginia Key, who is the founder of the club. I'm not going to go way back to my um, teenage years, but I did start volunteering by, vol by registering people to vote as Democrats, because we need people to participate and to vote. And as one of our former mayor has once said, Mayor Koch said that if you don't vote, you don't count. So regardless of ethnic background, where you live, as long as you can vote, you should register to vote. And that's what I learned at an early age. Fast forward to the most, uh, I guess, last few years, I have been working with communities and leaders across our district where we were working side by side to help those in need um, during the pandemic. That included folks who live in the co-op uh, villages. When the pandemic hit, I organized a team of volunteer and we worked, I coordinated with a team of folks to help make sure that those who need meals are able to get free meals from a nonprofit organization called Rethink. And during the, throughout the pandemic, we deliver over a million free meals. And some of those meals still continue today. Uh, most of it have uh, kind of wind down because of the, because of the restaurants being open and uh, many folks have, um, are not, do not need the, the meals. But I am here to talk with you because I value your the collaboration of many of the members in your club and i'm hoping that uh, you will consider me to uh, as i run for re-election as the state committee person thank you great thank you jenny um so i see there's a couple of hands up already so i'm going to um ca start calling on people kenny yeah, hi. I just have a quick question. The state Democratic uh, committee person is supposed to represent the Democratic yeah. Party and endorse Democratic candidates. Are you willing to endorse our current uh, council member, Chris Marte, for re-election in 2023? Well, Kenny, just so that you know, what the club for UDL, we, we actually have Christopher Mate on our palm card. So 
we will, when 2023 comes around, we will see who the candidates are and um, we will, whoever have earned the support of the club and myself. But the truth is right now, I'm, I actually am not able to endorse any candidate in the primary. Um, I am, I have accepted um, in the nomination and have been approved by the city council as the democratic commissioner at the board of election. So I, um, as a rule that I make for myself, I will stay away from primaries because candidates may come to the board of election in front of the commissioners with different issues. So I do not want to have any, um, any perceived uh, conflicts. So I'm, I will not endorse candidates in the primary, but in the November election, I will wholeheartedly endorse the Democratic candidate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony Alfieri. Hey, thanks. I just had a, a quick question. Um, voting rights and voting access is such a critical issue right now. And I was really disappointed um, in the last election when the two um, ballot initiatives for same day voter registration and no excuse absentee voting were um, really not supported um, adequately by our democratic leadership. And so I just wanted, I'm wondering why you opposed the vote of no confidence in Jay Jacobs um, uh, when that came up last month. So when that, it didn't, it didn't have the support of the majority of the um, state committee and it was vote by voice as well. And I, you know, Jay Jacob is someone that I thought can be, is, has been um, helping the, the state party. And um, while I have differences with him, I don't agree with everything that we have uh, without an, an alternative, uh, someone who, who I, I feel comfortable with. I chose to stay with someone that I already know. Okay, thank you. Um, Denny Salas. Hey, thank you. Uh, Jenny, first, just thank you for answering Kenny's question by pointing out that as a Board of Election member, it's likely not a good idea to endorse any candidate. Um, additionally, in a previous forum, you were somewhat attacked and accused of you know, allegedly not working on behalf of black and brown communities in Lower East Side. Um, I would love for you to point out a lot of the volunteer stuff that you do. And if you can, please take the floor and correct the record. Well, thank you for that question, Denny. Um, yes, I am Asian, I am Chinese, and yes, I support the Asian community, but I also support other communities who are uh, underrepresented. As someone who grew up poor, uh, we got, um, doesn't matter who I'm at, what my face looks like, I know what it feels, and I know what low-income community uh, have uh, the difficulties and the challenges that they have. When I was in the private sector, I was working for J.P. Morgan Chase's um, foundation, and I spent 10 years making grants uh, to nonprofit organizations managing a $5 million portfolio, supporting uh, work that organization that um, help to improve education, housing, workforce development, and many of these are in communities of color. And in terms of my personal work, I have been working with uh, folks not only in Lens and Two, uh, but also further on the um, Grand Street um, Grand Street Guild as well. And I um, have been working very closely with the Mariners Temple, whose parish, uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Mariners Temple is um, basically the longest serving black church in Lower East Side Chinatown area. They've been here for 226 years. And many of the members are uh, residents of um, NYCHA, especially since they're close to Smith houses, many, many of them are from Smith houses. So I work with them on the food pantry and also uh, every month. And I also help them uh, when the vaccine first came out, many people could not get um, appointments. 
uh, because they don't have access to the internet. And um, I was uh, working with the minister, Cynthia Garner Brim uh, at Mariner's Temple, helping members of their church and their uh, families getting vaccine appointments. And um, with the help of working also with Daisy Pius and others folks in, uh, in um, someone named um, Michelle Winfield and uh, other colleagues of mine, we have helped over a thousand people get appointments. This is at the early days of when when the when the when the vaccine came out, and it is. I'm here. I'm a member of this community. I help whenever I can. Okay, thank you, Laura Travers. Hi. Um. If I uh, heard you well, you've been uh, in the state committee since 2014, is that right? What is your uh, proudest uh, accomplishment? My, you know, as a member of this low east side Chinatown area, my proudest and um, accomplishment not necessarily have to do with um, but I'm not. I'm I'm an elected member of uh, the state committee or district leader that I serve as 25 years. It is the time when the community needs help. I was able to work with folks from the, all walks of life. We work together, and I think this is what we are all about as members of a community. Um, I am a very humble person, so I really don't. I won't. I. I don't talk about myself much. And um, I would just say that my, my most rewarding experience is really working with folks in the community and getting to know them. Like um, I help volunteer with uh, Fanny Yip in cleaning out the triangle. I met uh, 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 Manji and we became friends and just planting stuff, right? And I go to uh, help with Luther Garrick Park and we plan things together and I met another person that we became friends. So that that just, that, that's the reward for me. Thank you. Uh, you're at three minutes, Jenny. Okay, three minutes left. Well, since I don't see, uh, Marion, I don't see a hand, so I don't know if you see any, but um, I just wanted to, uh, to thank all of you for um, listening to my pitch. And um, I hope that we can continue to work together moving forward. Um, you guys do a lot in the Low East Side and as do I, and um, we sometimes work together, sometimes we may not be able to do uh, for whatever reason. So. Um, but I see a hand, Harriet, so I'm going to let Marion take control. <laughs> okay, Harriet. You know me, Jenny, I can't keep my mouth shut. Are you, are you still a judicial I, delegate? And you know that? Sorry, hold on one second. No, so uh, judicial delegates uh, are elected every year. Um, so... Jenny, you're on mute. Please unmute yourself. Uh, Jenny, can, does I got need it. to unmute? Yeah. Okay. There. I just, okay. yeah, I, I put it down. Um, I am actually not a judicial delegate, Harriet. Um, but they're elected every year. But I, um, I work with all the, the, the clubs in uh, 65 Assembly District. I actually help the clubs put together the, the slate of candidates that we agreed on. And I help get the petition um, out. OK. But, but, but you're involved in, in that process. Yes, I am. Yeah. OK. Thank you. OK, Thank Jenny. You. Thank you so much for your time tonight and your presentation. And I'm going to lead us now to our last candidate of the evening, also a female contender for state committee, um, 20, District 26, and that is um, Catherine Freed. Catherine, are you on? Yes, I think I am. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, there you are. OK, so the same rule. You have 15 minutes. You break it up as you like. Carolyn will keep you to time I and <laughs> I will ask the questionnaires, the questioners to be succinct and on point. 
And okay, you're on. Thank you. All right. Um, fortunately, Josh did a lot of the information about what State Committee does. So I think I'll just start off telling people a little bit about me um, because a lot of you haven't seen me lately uh, because until about oh June of last year, I was still a uh, Supreme Court, a New York State Supreme Court justice, and I'd been doing that for 17 years. Prior to that time, I was the uh, the city council member for the first council district in Lower Manhattan, which included a lot of the 65th Assembly District. Also included what is now uh, the 66th Assembly District. So I had both East and West Side. And prior to that time, I um, was in private practice as an attorney. I basically represented tenants, uh, did uh, discrimination, especially employment discrimination work and uh, election law. And I also worked um, for six years as a, as a counsel to several committees uh, for the assembly. So I have a fairly good working of all levels of the uh, state and city government. Um, I've lived in, I live in East River Houses. I've lived here for 17 years. Prior to that time, I lived in Lower Manhattan. I lived in Tribeca, Soho, and Chinatown, or what was on the edges of Chinatown. So, um, and since I have, uh, since I've retired as a judge, I guess it took me 10 minutes before I called Chris Marte and offered to endorse him. And I worked, um, I particularly got involved in two issues at that time. One was opposing the Soho, NoHo, and Chinatown upzoning, it, which is clearly a giveaway to the developers and large real estate, and I still oppose it. And uh, unfortunately, the mayor signed that bill. But fortunately, he did get rid of a side bill that uh, our former council member, uh, Margaret Chin had supported, which was really punitive for people who'd been in Soho. Now, I was particularly concerned about Soho because I actually helped uh, write a lot of the Soho zoning and help Soho uh, get historic district status. I also worked uh, same way in Tribeca and had proposed NoHo getting um, uh, becoming a historic district. Uh, as a council member, I worked very closely with all the communities in Lower Manhattan, especially in Chinatown. I represented a number of the NYCHA developments. I worked very closely with them, helping them get, um, well, pretty much anything because they were, even then, and we're talking in the 90s, they were still woefully neglected by the city and by the federal government. So I worked very closely with them, with their tenant association. I worked closely in getting... Um, heat, hot water, uh, helping get open spaces. I worked very closely with a lot of the schools, getting computerizations for the schools, getting uh, playgrounds. And um, the second thing that I've worked on very extensively since I was, you know, since I've been retired is East River Park and working with East River Park Action. I actually volunteered for a lot of uh, the legal work, but I've also been very involved in just getting organized, doing press conferences, and um, generally <clears throat> um, basically doing what the neighborhood needs because we're not being, you know, we're not being helped, we're not being told, there's no transparency in what's going on. I recently sat through both the CAG meeting and the community board meeting and we can't get an answer. And there's a lot of questions that need answering. There are a lot of questions about the environment, about what's gonna happen with the air, what's gonna happen with the uh, composition of the soil that's out there because they know that it's high in lead and a lot of other heavy metals, how they're going to how they're going to keep that from blowing all over us. This, uh, the same question was what's gonna happen with the air, with trucking and or barging in a lot of the fill. And I intend to uh, continue to be working with East River Park action. Um, as far as the state committee part, as I said, I think I'm very, I'm very involved with, um, have been involved with all levels of government. I was one of the original founders of the Downtown Independent Democrats. So I'm still very close with that, with that club and with that community. And um, I certainly consider myself a progressive and would look forward to working for the, with the progressive caucus of the party. So I think that's pretty much who I am. So um, 
I'll open it up, you know, take questions. Thank you, Catherine. That's a really good be good beginning. And um, if I might, I'm going to use my position to as ask the first question on this one. And um, actually, I'm going to. I'm not going to. Harriet, why don't you ask the first question? Um, my question is this: uh, How how can you utilize all of of the, your expertise in uh, as a judge uh, at, in this new role, and and I, I will be a little bit more specific. I'm um, there's a lot of injustice in, for example, divorce court. You know, if uh, in criminal court, if you don't have the money, you are assigned an attorney. You you have that right. In divorce court, a lot of women don't have the money to fight and they don't don't have the ability to get any kind of representation do you feel that you can use your this new position to influence that in any way um well i there are several things there's the question of the election of judges itself and asking and finding out just generally or actually even more so just um, acquainting them with the problem if they're not aware of it as they're uh, running for judge. But I think it might be very possible to work with the judiciary committees of both the assembly and the Senate. Um, I happen to be very close friends with Brad Hoyleman, who's the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and uh, see if there's something we can put forward about getting representation or at the very least getting um, uh, volunteers who would be willing to uh, sit down and talk to women who, or actually women or men, but usually it's true. It's usually the woman who doesn't, doesn't have the financial capacity to, um, to get an attorney to, so work with people to, so that they can talk to them about their rights are, what their rights are. But I think the idea of making sure that there are, or that there is a group of attorneys who would be willing to uh, volunteer to do pro, pro se work um, in that area so that they could represent the women. I mean, most attorneys attorneys are required to do a certain amount of pro se representation. So I think it would be a good idea to get together to get attorneys who would be willing to do that. And then we can also look at the idea of maybe seeing if there's some way that we can also get financial support. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, Laura. Um, hi, I apologize in advance. My, my, my question may be a little um, inarticulated, but since it's a position within the Democratic Party, and since um, I feel like, like for instance, in the case of the, the, the previous mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, he, he was in many ways not really representing the interests of the, the people. He was, that's my opinion. He was supposed to. to I'm not a big fan of the ex mayors. Right. So, can the Democratic Party do anything to prevent or to discourage or, or, or uh, such uh, terrible politicians to act, uh, get so much power? Where to start with that? But you know what? The bottom line is, though, that we really have to educate people in the public, get more people, get more people registered, get them acquainted, apparently, apprise them of their rights. The thing that has surprised me the most about representatives here on the east side of Manhattan, because I had been on the west side when I was in office, um, is that you have representatives that don't represent you. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that all the clubs in this area, and I think Josh mentioned it also, that what we really have to do is work with getting more people registered, getting them better informed of what the issues are, what rights they have, trying to, you know, just watching what happened with East River Park and the number of people who went along blithely about their lives until all of a sudden there was no park there. And then they're like, oh, what happened? Well, and I know, you know, East River Park and the advocates work very, very hard on that. So we need to have a better structure 
a better political structure with people in in this area about so the you know getting them up to snuff on what the issues are and telling them why it's really important for them to um, to know what the issues are and to get out and vote and make sure that they get people who represent them who really represent them that they won't think that oh maybe having a ferry that goes to Governor's Island is somehow the same as having a beautiful park out there that you can take your family to and all you have to do is walk across you know get across the FDR um you know it's I got very involved in East River because just on an intellectual level, the idea of destroying a beautiful park that's such an asset and so important, important, even to the mental, you know, makeup of this neighborhood, not to mention the environmental health that, that you know, that it impacts, but the, just the idea of destroying a thousand trees for no reason when you could do something just as effective and leave the trees and leave the squirrels and the butterflies and the bees and, you know, everything else in place and we could still enjoy it. I mean, on an intellectual level, it's insane. And if you know anything about climate and resiliency and the idea that other countries and other cities and even other parts of this city are putting out green berms and they're putting in more trees and more parks as the best way to stop the, the, the oceans from flowing over us. And yet here, they're just, they destroyed our park and they're not gonna put back a park that's gonna look like that. It's gonna be 60% concrete and artificial turf. So, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. And that just tells you that we have to do a better job of getting that message out there to people and tell them they have rights, that they can stand up for things. And the other thing that I think that's happened that's really been horrible about this is the racial polarization that it's, that it's caused. The, Sorry, three Kathy, minutes, you right? got three minutes to go, okay? Thank you. Okay, just very quickly, I mean, the idea of, of setting the NYCHA tenants against the other, the other residents down here or people who come in to use the park is a very, very dangerous precedent. And a similar thing happened on the whole Soho, NoHo, Chinatown upzoning, where, where there were influences who tried to make it, you know, wealthy against non-wealthy and with the implication that somehow it was or could be racial. And we have to stop that. We're all in this together. We all have to breathe the same air. You know, we all have the same problems. Obviously, some people have bigger problems because they don't have the incomes, but we have to work with them. And we certainly have to make sure that the resources get to them and that they know what they can do and what their rights are and help them in that area. Thank you, um, Tommy. Sorry, I get intense. <laughs> That's okay. Yes, um, as you know, Chris Marte was the endorsed candidate of this club and has the support and the previous uh, speaker would not commit to running against Chris in the next election. Would you make a commitment not to run against Chris Marte? I'm not to run against Chris. I supported him and he actually is supporting me. So, <laughs> yes. And I expect Chris to be a great council member. Okay, thank you. Melissa, did I see your hand come and go? No. Okay, any, any other questions? We're counting off the final, the final moments. Marian, may I say something? Of course. Please. And this is not about Catherine, but I wanted to just answer um, Tommy Lowe's um, comment. All right, you know what? Actually, I, I would not like you to answer that. I, I think we're, we, have, we have presentation question and answer. We're at the very end of the evening. We have 41 minutes, 41 seconds left. And I would not like you to be responding. It's not, it's not how the forum is set up. Is that okay? You and Tommy can certainly have that conversation offline. Your club, your rule. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jenny. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. I know it's been a long evening. I just want to remind you all, we will, um, we will make sure that this tape is up for you to see and for anyone who couldn't get here tonight. I've been keeping notes on the chat. 
So we'll make sure that becomes available for anyone. We will do our endorsements, probably another long night on February 15th. Um, and uh, thank you all. I appreciate you, you all. Marian. Thank you, Carolyn, thank for you. being the timekeeper. Uh, thanks, everybody. Okay. Well Good night, all. all. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night, Thank everybody. Bye. Good night. Hi. Um, I'm stopping recording. Okay. <laughs>